Okay, members, can I welcome you to our 118th committee meeting of the Culture, Arts and Leisure Committee. Um, we have a quorum. Could I just remind members and everyone who's coming into the public gallery just to switch off your mobile phones as it may interfere with the recording. And with regards to your tablet, if you wish to switch, I would like you to switch the sound off. It's function and IF8. And also as we move through today's business, if you could declare any interests, financial or otherwise. Just with regards to apologies, I don't have any formal apologies. If members have any on behalf of other members. Mr. Hodgson. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No. No, no, no. Moving then to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 19th of June. There at page five. We seek agreement from members of those with an reflection of today's, of last week's meeting. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Moving then to our matters arising. I'm referring to correspondence track at page nine. Um, the details are there. Um, page 10 is a copy of the DECAL Creative Industries Economic Estimates Experimental Statistics for 2014. And there are a number of significant points which are highlighted in, in, that, um, in that paper. If, if members are content, uh, Steve McGowan has actually moved on and he does have a replacement. So if members would be content that we ask whoever that may be. The name has escaped. Everyone yes. at the moment, but if we can do that um, and just get them to come uh, and brief us on that paper, that might be useful for us. Just in light of our inquiry uh, on creative industries, I think that might be useful. Yeah. Um, next item at page 35 is from Sport and I regarding women in sport. And again, they've highlighted quite a few interesting points for us. Um, Sport and I will come to the committee in autumn. In the autumn, so we're hoping that they will brief us on that matter. And again, if, if you're content that we note that correspondence at this stage, and just refer back to it again at that stage. Okay, agreed. Okay, and there's a response then from the department at page three in the table papers, and this refers to our query about the current position of the sub regional capital programme and the um, committee suggestion that perhaps the three. three £35.3 million pounds from the case for the park easement could have been directed um, to, to that project. Um, the Minister has indicated that um, the sub regional programme will have a spend of £36.2 million. However, it's at an early planning stage and will be a priority in the next CSR. Strategic outline business case has been prepared and this will form the basis of a bid to the executive. Therefore, the case for the easement could not be utilised for this programme. Are you content to, to note it at this stage? Um, but it's something that we will, will want to return to, I think, um, in early in September. There's a table pack regarding the, an update from the Minister on the review report on sign language partnership group strategic direction on the roadmap. We'd received a briefing from departmental officials regarding this review in January. The Minister has forwarded the interim report, which was prepared by Damien Barry, and this is at page 7 of the table pack. Um, the final report is expected in September uh, and the committee will be briefed again. So if we could perhaps pencil that into our full work programme um, for early in, in the autumn. If you're content to note that at this stage. Okay. Page 34 in the tail pack, there is a further response to uh, the committee regarding the cracked windows and glass panels at the Crowley building. <laughs> the Minister's indicated that the glass had a standard one-year manufacturer's warranty and there was a further one-year building defects warranty. So I think we've probably explored that as much as we possibly can. If this is a members are content that we note that correspondence. So unless you have any comments to make. Nope. Moving then to correspondence, um, just refer you to Education Committee um, letter regarding a proposed shared sports campus in North Belfast. This is at page 73. Uh, the Education Committee had noted correspondence from Lockside concerned residents regarding the development of Lockside Park. That's meeting on the 18th of June. The residents had expressed concerns about the environmental damage this development will create and the effect it will have on non-sporting users of the park. Do you have members have any comments on that? Would you be content that we forward this then to the Minister just for, for comment? Indeed. Anyone else? No? no. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, I refer you then to the report on the potential for bringing Loch Ney into public ownership, a scoping study. This was compiled by the Loch Ney Cross Departmental Working Group, and it's at page 85. Um, the report was completed in February and was forwarded to the committee by the ARD committee. As you're aware, DECAL does sit on the working group, which was established in April 2012, just to investigate the potential of public ownership of the lock. Uh, the working group has recommended that the executive doesn't pursue any transfer to, of ownership, but that the executive tasks the working group to revise the current public management structure to make it more representative. Um, as a member of the Yard Committee and, and other members of, who, who sit on both committees will be aware that we had a briefing on Tuesday with regards to that, and there are a number of options being looked at um, and various models um, which are being explored. So again, if, if, if members actually maybe want to, to ask for a copy of the briefs <coughs> coming from the Yard Committee with regards to that, and we'll just keep a watching brief on it. Yeah. Okay. Then to an email from Sport and I regarding equality screening at page 136. Um, Sport and I is asking for views on the active awards for sport programme, recruitment and selection, and the new capital programme. I wonder if the committee has any comments at this stage or whether you wish to, to note and maybe seek a briefing um, again with, with Sport and I with regards to that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I refer you then to correspondence from the British Longbow in Ireland team at page 137. Um, the document details um, the team's recent successes in the annual match against Scotland. Um, so unless we wish to just maybe forward a letter of congratulations to them um, and, and note that correspondence. It's longbow rather than strongbow. <laughs> yes. Okay, so members are happy enough for that. I know. We move then to our committee inquiry. We have two presentations today. <coughs> First is from the Lodge Arts and the second is from the Spectrum Centre. So we'll ask uh, witnesses then to come forward from New Lodge Arts. Just refer you to Clark's memo. Uh, which includes a list of the organisations which have written to us at page 140 and the briefing paper from New Lodge Arts at page 147. Yes. Katrina Newell is the Head of Arts and Youth Development. You're very welcome to the committee. Would you like to introduce your team? Um, I will. Thank you very much, Chair, and um, thank the members for the opportunity to come along and present. My name is Katrina Newell. I'm Head of Arts and Youth Development for Ashton Community Trust and New Lodge Arts. <coughs> and Amy is our Arts and Programme Manager for New Lodge Arts. Ryan McMahon is a former participant and now work colleague. Um, he is our Office Assistant and Youth Worker. And Caitlin O'Neill is a Programme Participant. Okay, thank you. So, um, as I say, thank you very much for the invitation to, to come along. Um, we're going to provide you with a brief overview of who we are, what we do, and give a quick summary of the key points of our submission and some practical suggestions and recommendations. So, New Lodge Arts is a community-based arts organisation that started over 11 years ago as, one, as a one-year pilot project delivered by Ashton Community Trust. Our aim, then, as it still is, was to provide access to high quality arts programs and activities on the ground in the community to children and young people from the age of three to 17 years and their families. When we began 11 years ago, one um, local youth worker asked why we were bringing arts into the New Lodge, how relevant they were, and what real impact would they have on young people facing the multitude of um, issues and difficulties that, that they were facing. Um, but the proof was in the pudding. Um, as one might say, he saw the positive impact that participation had on young people's confidence, self-esteem, skills development, problem solving, creative thinking, understanding, accepting others, the list goes on. Um, since 2003, New Lodge Arts has grown to become an organisation in its own right as a subsidiary of Ashton, and that youth worker actually became our first chair whenever we did so. Um, his added, or his through the proof and through the impact that he saw um, it making, he had a complete shift in, in thinking. 
So we're completely embedded in the North Belfast community and we recognise that there are barriers to participation such as finance, um, confidence, feeling out of place in art venues and so on. And our role is to attract resources and deliver programmes on the ground within communities that address these barriers and then encourage and bring young people and children to venues and other establishments that provide um, arts-based activities and performances across the city and beyond. Um, we have a strong community focus and a passion for supporting the needs of children and young people within the area. and We want to provide creative opportunities that unlock their potential. Um, when we began in 2003, our primary focus was the Greater New Lodge, um, but our work now spans across North Belfast. So I'm going to hand over to Anne to hear more about our current work and its impacts. Yeah. Um, in the last financial year, we've delivered 820 workshops with over 4,300 children and young people from across North Belfast attending. We have worked with 25 community groups and 16 schools. The organisation has grown organically over the last 11 years, delivering a programme that has had a positive impact on the lives of many young people across North Belfast. New Lodge Arts belongs to the young people. It provides them with opportunities where they can be free to express themselves, access skills development and challenge and challenges that inspire them to learn, raise their aspirations and grow emotionally and intellectually. We believe in the transform transformative power of the arts, enabling young people to see themselves as creative beings. There are a raft of issues affecting young people within the North, Be North Belfast area, such as interface violence, <coughs> drug abuse, suicide, self-harm, poor mental health, poverty, low educational attainment, lack of role models, depression and drug dependency. Our programmes continue to have a positive impact on, the, on young people by building aspirations, providing training and development opportunities, promoting health and well-being, building good relations and increasing creativity. We want to enable young people to be artists, not simply to receive the arts, but to make and be actual contributors. We work in the community where people live and where the need is. However, we also see the value in bringing young people to venues across the city to experience new art forms. We brought groups to the Opera House to see the Opera House to see Opera, to see contemporary dance in the Mac, pantomimes in the Lyric in the Waterfront, exhibitions in the Museum and PS Squared. We are generously supported by the Arts Council as our primary funder, Belfast City Council, Children in Need, OFM DFM through a National Community Trust project and also various trusts and foundations. So in terms of some of the key challenges that we have um, that we come across and that are relevant to this um, to our submission, um, accessibility to arts venues across the city. The cost of ticketing and transport remains a challenge for us um, as an organization. As we've mentioned, we want to bring children and young people to see um, see performances and events elsewhere, but um, because that will feed their imagination and feed into their own creative development and their own practices. Um, and give them new experience and also um, broaden their horizons. It's, it's, it's bringing them to parts of Belfast that they would never have been to, let alone bringing them to London, Belgium, as we've recently come back from. Um, and we work with organisations like the Lyric who provide us with free and reduced rate tickets, enabling us to bring young people to performances. And there are other organisations who provide um, reduced rate tickets, um, but usually when they're having problems filling their seats. So it can be last minute, and the challenge then for us is we want to provide the opportunities for young people, but we have a challenge with getting support workers, getting parental consent, getting the kind of practicalities of bringing young people to those performances. Um, so in our minds then, it's, it's less about inclusion and more about simply filling seats. Um, in relation to outreach programmes, we, we do welcome collaboration with other organisations through their outreach programmes. And, you know, Anne has talked about different um, organisations that we work with, like Prime Cut and um, DU Dance, and are an excellent programme we've just finished with um, the Ulster Museum. And the most successful collaborations for us are collaborations which, where we're involved from the very onset, where, from the very idea stage, so that we can input um, our ideas and also discuss some of the challenges that we have around participation and the barriers to participation. Um, for instance, one of the challenges that we would have is young people um, not feeling confident. We can often be offered, where we're situated in postcode wise, we can often be offered um, bursaries for young people to participate in different programmes. But because of the confidence, young people aren't picking up on those. Um, so what we often do is 
we feel we need to bring the young people to those, at least to, to, so that they feel um, supported in that. Um, but often when we're doing outreach programmes, if the outreach programme has already been developed, there isn't um, an opportunity to have a support worker as part of that. So we're either looking for our, in our own resources or going along ourselves, um, which you know, you're competing with having to write funding applications, having to evaluate programmes, all the administrative side of things, as well as develop a whole wrath of other programmes. So those are the kind of key challenges. But as I say, when we're involved um, from the very onset, we can, we can highlight those challenges with the other um, organisations. Another challenge as well is in terms of meeting the needs across um, communities in North Belfast. More and more groups want to avail of our services. Um, and while we do deliver taster activities across North Belfast and events and programmes and outreach programmes relating to um, our core um, programmes, we have an arts academy which is our core um, programme that's primarily focused on Greater New Lodge. Um, due to the resources that we have for that. Um, as much as possible, we would deliver those activities in neutral venues um, or satellite tasters happening in other communities, but we really would love to expand that across um, and to, to provide consistent programmes within other communities in North Belfast so that young people, regardless of what community they come from, can access that, they can choose to come along. We would have young people as young as five turning up for ballet um, because they've heard about it from their friend in school. Now they're coming along um, on their own because they're um, choosing what extracurricular activities they want to get involved in at that age. But that's because it's on their doorstep. They can access it. It's free. Um, so that's why for us access is extremely important to be provided in, the, in their own um, communities. Um, we did have a recent application in with Esme Furburn to develop that um, and it was unsuccessful and it's something that we're continuing to work on. Yeah. So I will now address our recommendations for improvement within the policy. Uh, firstly, we would like better cross-cutting themes across departments, for example, um, health, uh, using the benefits of the arts within health. Um, a more collaborative approach by arts venues to outreach, as Katrina has already addressed. Um, venues providing a percentage of free ticketing for disadvantaged communities alongside with free transport. We would also encourage larger venues to support community arts organisations by offering discounted or free venue hire and technical support. We would also recommend sustained investment in community arts activities. You know, arts want to continue to expand and grow. Our, challenge, our, our challenges for the next few years are to expand the Arts Academy and seek funding from various trusts and foundations. We also want to uh, employ an artist in residence to work within the community and normalise the idea of being an artist. We want to develop our programme of accredited training to encourage the development of young people. We want to have a clear focus on creative industries and social enterprise. We want to expand our international project offering. And now I'm going to hand you over to Caitlin O'Neill, who is a young person who's been involved in our programme for many years, just to give you an, a bit of an insight from a young person's perspective. I've been involved in New Lodge Arts for eight years and have had so many great experiences. I've participated in weekly dance and drama classes, performed in the Opera House, exhibited artwork in the Ulster Museum and National Portrait Gallery, travelled to Belgium and London on a history trip and took part in the Merge Dance Project with Do Dance. New Large Arts have supported me to develop my talents. Last year I took part in a Grand Opera House annual youth summer production of Annie. Without my experience in New Large Arts, I wouldn't have had the confidence to get involved in something like this outside of my local area. I've always felt intimidated by bigger arts venues and organisations, but New Large Arts brought me to see several shows and I realised I could be part of them. I have made many friends from different backgrounds through my involvement with New Large Arts. Two of my best friends are Protestants from Ballyzillan, and I met them at the New Lodge Arts Panto two years ago. I wouldn't have had the opportunity to meet people from different backgrounds unless I was involved with the company. I am, more confident, I am a more confident young person and I feel that New Lodge Arts is like a second family. Everyone involved is current and supportive and young people are all treated equally. I am excited for further future projects with the company. And uh, now I hand you over to Ryan um, McMahon, who's currently employed with us as our office assistant, but has been a former participant. Hi, guys. <laughs> my name is Ryan, and I live in New Lodge, and I've lived there all my life. I'm now working in New Lodge Arts. Um, 
um, example of how the arts have made an impact on young people in disadvantaged communities. Um, I got involved in New Lodge Arts six years ago through their dance and drama projects. Um, I was attracted to their classes because they were free and they were right on my doorstep. Uh, I wouldn't have had the opportunity to go outside Mario to access classes as my mommy wouldn't have, she wouldn't be able to pay for the transport and it would have been too, too, like, too expensive to splash out on. Um, I wouldn't have had the confidence to sign up to other drama projects and arts venues because <coughs> I, I would have felt out of place. Um, I had a perception of being judged by others who came from more like well-off areas. I would have felt like they're all like looking at me. Um, over the years, through my involvement in New Lodge Arts, I performed in local venues in North Belfast. And the most exciting experience was performing in the Grand Opera House. Uh, throughout the years, New Lodge Arts have brought me to shows in the Mac, in the Lyric, and in the Opera House. Uh, the Waterfront, the Argent Crescent Arts Centre, and London's West End. I've gained a lot of skills from my experience in New Lodge Arts. And when I was a teenager, Katrina came back me up, I was difficult to work with. <laughs> um, <laughs> but New Lodge Arts have taught me to grow as a person and developing my confidence and self-esteem and really improved limited communication skills. Now I can talk to people with manners. <laughs> um, after GCSEs, I left school and spent two years on like no, no the job seekers, like the brain, and with no, motiva no motivation or direction in my life. Um, but over the last six months, I've been on a placement with New Lodge Arts and have developed a lot of skills in, in the workplace. So, uh, so much so that I've been offered a full-time job until next March. Uh, and I, I know where I want to go in my life now. Um, and I have a purpose for getting out of bed. And I'm committed to supporting young people within the local area because I know what it feels like to have no direction and feel lost and not being able to give a chance. Um, I think other young people should be given opportunities like me, such as apprenticeships and placement schemes to help them in their future careers if they want to go into the arts. That's, thanks, guys. <laughs> That's us. Thank you very much. Thank you very uh, much for your presentation and thank you for Ryan and Keelan for sharing their experiences. You've talked about the transformative power of the arts and also um, the idea that it does promote health and well-being. Can you maybe give some examples of how that has manifested itself within your community? Um, well, we've delivered projects in the past working with PIPs um, and we're working with families and um, looking at some of the the impacts of suicide um, on families and uh, providing them with an opportunity to, through the arts, to use a creative approach, um, not so much a creative approach, but using arts-based activities to, to basically share their um, experiences. Um, we've also in the past worked with young people um, looking at some issues around um, homophobia and xenophobia and um, some of the issues as well around people from other communities or other countries um, coming into the area to challenge um, some of the, the sort of perceptions that young people from the community would have. Um, also we've been working, um, a lot of the work that we do is tackling very, it's, it's firefighting. Um, so there's um, projects that we've also been that have kind of came up based on needs. So there's been projects developed around um, the issue of bonfires. So we work with a group of young people who had been involved in challenging behaviour within the community. Um, and to look at an alternative way of um, building bonfires or an alternative way of using the, the activity that they enjoyed doing, which was collecting wood and, and um, um, building bonfires and we, um, they created a fire sculpture that then was part of a community <laughs> event. So for them, it was an opportunity to participate as positive citizens within the community. It gave the community an opportunity to see them in a positive role. They ended up volunteering at the event, um, handing out leaflets to children and families that were at the event. It had a really positive impact on their perception of themselves and the perception of the wider community and also the police. Um, the police had asked us at the event, why are these young people, are they, you know, are they part of the event, what's happening? And they said, actually, they um, um, contributed quite a lot to the event um, that everyone, the whole community, could enjoy. So, you know, there's real impacts. Um, those are just a few examples. Mm -hmm. you any other? Uh, no. And do you have any direct links through to the Belfast Trust? Um, yes, well... Um, <coughs> 
we would have links through some of our other work and our connections with Ashton um, Community Trust. We would deliver through our connections with Ashton and um, my role within the New Lodge Youth Centre. We would work um, through a family support programme that would involve arts activities being delivered as well. Um, as part of that programme, obviously, there's a whole remit of other programmes around looking at health and wellbeing, looking at cooking programmes, looking at horticulture and gardening. Um, we've delivered projects in the past which have brought in artists to encourage the community and residents to, to um, come together more and come up with their own ideas. So the, the artists have been encouraging the dialogue and um, creative thinking. And out of those projects, one of the most significant projects that we delivered um, in Glandor Skegenil was a community garden. Pardon the pun, that grew out of the project. Um, it was completely led by the community and it was something that they felt that um, they wanted to achieve and from that a community developed around that garden and um, that would be one example. Okay, that's good. Can you, can you maybe elaborate maybe on, on the links that you have with other arts groups in and around Belfast? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, um, we, have, we have experience working with a number of, of various arts organisations. Um, I have a, a kind of good example would be working with Prime Cut Theatre Company. Uh, and they're really about um, offering opportunities for young people to experience a high level of um, theatre activity, working with top artistic directors from Dublin um, who come together. And, and I think the, the strength in working with them is that they're collaborating with us from the start. So they're involving us in the planning of the programme and looking at the needs of the young people and then developing the programme in line with them. So, and I think with the, the previous project we worked on with them last year, Boundaries, like what they'd set out to do at the start wasn't necessarily what they ended up with, but it was about that collaborative approach with the young people that really made the impact. And that's what we um, see as very important for going ahead. And we do know that people do approach us and they want us to get involved in our outreach programme because we do tick a box, we tick that BT15 um, box that they may be wanting to tick. And, uh, but we, we're very kind of strict on who we work with. We want to make sure they've got the same values and ethos as, as we have as an organisation. And um, so that's the kind of pro the process that we take going forward because we want it to be a nurturing experience for the young people and to give them, to widen their access to the arts. We want to make sure that we're doing that with the right um, type of organisation. Can I just ask you what type of facility that you have? We don't have a facility. We have um, an office space um, in Ashton Centre and then we use whatever facilities or spaces we can get our hands on across North Belfast. Um, it's got positive, um, th there's a lot of positivity to that because it um, breaks down that idea of parochialism. People, young people will travel to other venues. They don't feel, oh, I only belong to this venue or this venue. Um, it also has young people going into different communities as well. Um, so we, we don't have a space. And I think the, the other thing is that it's forced us to go on into other communities. So it's expanded our programme across North Belfast and that we go into different community and youth groups offering a variety of arts activities. Whereas if we had the one space um, in the new lodge, for example, people from those other, er other areas may not come to, to what we're doing. So it is a strength. We are in a crowded office, and uh, but but it works. And uh, I suppose we want to focus more on the participation and um, and by using these other venues, it's, it's helped us really to do that. Okay, I think that's very positive and a very good example then for others who feel that perhaps they need to have their own space in order to do a piece of work. And I congratulate you for that. Thank you. Just open up then to other members, um, Mr. Hilditch. Thanks, Chair. And thanks for the, thanks for the presentation. Very useful and. Um, I know you do a lot of fine work over the 52 weeks a year, but do you have a dedicated arts festival as such? We have a community pride programme that we would take the lead on, but it's in partnership with other um, community representatives, if you, if you like, from across North Belfast. Um, it's called the Community Pride Programme. We um, would deliver, um, well, pen, dependent on funding, um, we would deliver a one-week summer youth arts program um, and then we would also run a North Belfast Lantern Parade that while it's it's one event that has an outreach program attached to it and um, it often that would run for two months and then the, the actual event itself would have activities delivered over several days. So this year we're actually looking at um, developing that more into a festival that happens at the end of October. Um, and then we also have a um, Winterfest, Winter Festival program that isn't just ourselves, 
All our work is about collaboration and participation, and we don't need to do everything, but we need to be supporting and working together more effectively with other communities <coughs> and other arts organisations. So, for instance, if other groups within North Belfast, Whitewell, White City, or wherever are delivering um, events during that period, we all promote our work together as part of that festival. Um, and again, the steering group um, would advise on that, the Community Pride steering group would advise on that. But it's very much about how we can collaborate um, and bring our work together. And the, well, the strength of the Winterfest programme as well is that we're providing normally free activities. So it's free to bring your child to come and see Santa, to take part in various arts activities. There's free food. And these events, like there's hundreds of people that come to them, um, with our Christmas pantomime as well, which um, Caitlin would have experienced in performing. It's two pound a ticket to come and see it. So, and and it really, like, it really is. A, it's a brilliant show. And for a lot of families that we're working with, they can't afford to go to pay twenty pound for the opera house um, or anywhere else for that matter, or seven quid or nine pounds to go and see something. <coughs> so we're providing these activities within the local area at low cost and or or no cost and uh, so that's a real strength of, of what we're doing and um, how we want to continue in the future as well. And also um, one of the examples from that Winterfest is working with other organisations um, or working with other collectives if you like, um, Events for All for instance um, and one of the, the, the Santa's Grottos, we would obviously, it's not simply a Santa's Grottos, there's a whole series of artists there and it's about um, encouraging families to think about how they can play together or create together. Um, so creating things out of recycled materials, but that takes place in Duncan Gardens, um, so which is an interface, but it obviously brings people together from either side of that interface and, and beyond <coughs> across North Belfast to take part in, in a free activity and experience something really positive. So it has all those knock-on effects of, of you know, um, promoting good relations, shared space, and so on. Does it close proximity in, in North Belfast area there and down in the Cathedral Quarter? I, the cultural night has always been an mm -hmm. example of how to bring the arts into the public space as such. Do you take part in that? Or do you? Yeah, we've had, um, we've had a very positive experiences with Culture Night. Um, last year we had, like, again, Caitlin, I think Caitlin does everything we do nearly. <laughs> we, um, we had a group of young people performing in a shipping container, which was 10 foot by 8 foot. The play um, was devised by a group of young people from the Cliftonville Community Centre and it was about percept how young people are perceived within their community. So we had uh, four participants in this little uh, 10 foot by 8 foot box and audiences of about between 10 and 13 people were invited in, locked in the box for eight minutes show. And, uh, but the, the impact of that was that we had, you know, the young people were it was looking at how um, they're presented by older people within their community, how if they're wearing a hoodie, does that make them a bad young person, or <coughs> also about how, how they're treated as well. So it was, um, it was a really exciting night. We decided we would do four performances that night, ended up doing, I think it was about 13, because um, the kids li um, like to please their audiences. <laughs> And, um, that would be a, a good way of breaking down the barriers. It was <coughs> definitely, like and um, even for us to also like kind of showcase the innovative work that we do as well. And uh, so that was that was one example. And then the previous year, previous year, yeah, we had um, a dance squad down participating. Um, I think they did three performances. So it's fantastic, I think, for our participants to participate at that level. But it's also to say that. We're not, you know, some people I think have perception of community arts as, you know, something that's lower quality or, or you know, uh, lower down the, the ladder. For us, it's about saying, no, we're, we're delivering activities and performances that are at the same level as other professional arts organisations. We're delivering professional quality um, performances. So that's an opportunity to showcase it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just maybe a more sort of basic question or maybe a more controversial perhaps. Uh, as a grassroots uh, community-based organisation, how would you rate the assistance or the interaction of, of the established well-known arts organisations? I know you said you worked with the Lyric, but with the other evidence here where they're coming in, maybe the high end of the, the, end of the arts, <coughs> telling us how great they are working in the community and whatnot. Do you see that? Is that your perception or um, experience? We've had a positive experience, um, definitely with the Opera House last year. For our um, end of term showcase, which brings together various um, dance and drama projects, 
they offered us two, two nights free um, in the baby grand, which was, it was a fantastic experience for us. It gave us a chance for our young people to perform in the baby grand. It was very exciting. Um, but also then to bring families down to the opera house, many of whom may not have been there before. And uh, again, we were providing free tickets uh, for the show and we also provided transport. So it was, it was definitely um, a welcomed opportunity uh, from the opera house and something that we are keen to continue in the future. But maybe not happen as much as maybe the committee has been told, perhaps? I think there could be more done. Um, and I think, as Anne has mentioned earlier, um, we, we're more fussy now as well. Um, in the past, whenever I started up um, working with New Lodge Arts, I was saying yes to every opportunity that was coming along. But the opportunity was coming along um, packaged. You know, it was going to be this amount of young people from this community, this amount from another community. The actual medium, the subject matter, everything was packaged. There was no role for us to engage. There was no opportunity for us to engage around our experiences of what the barriers might be or for the young people themselves to engage around the idea. So if and when that happens, we will say no if the values and the kind of ethos isn't there. Um, because it has to be, as Anne says, it has to be about the right nurturing experience. Um, I do think there could be a lot more done around outreach, but definitely around ticketing. I brought this up um, with the City Council previously when we've been looking at, um, you know, when we've been doing um, working together on their strategic plan, their operational plans. M moving forward, um, there are big organisations who are taking up quite a lot of the um, funding, especially they're, when they're based, you know, their postcode also gives them a, a base, <coughs> one could say, in, in a um, disadvantaged community. And I think there should be some. Um, as Anne mentioned, there should be some sort of something within their um, contracts or the contracts of funding that um, ensures that they're meeting social the needs, commitment, yeah. social commitment and meeting the needs of the community, not just tick box and exercise. Um, That's good. That's, that's, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Bradley. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much for your presentation. <coughs> just to explore uh, the point that Mr. Hilditch um, brought up there about outreach. Um, you know, even the um, provision of ticketing, it, it could be just, a, you know, a very short-term thing, like a sort of flash in the pan where, you, you know, the young people get to see one show in one theatre and then it's sort of gone. Um, do you think it would be useful to have more developed um, outreach where, say, a large theatre, orchestra, venue, whatever, um, links into your project for a longer period, but perhaps one to two years, and develops some sort of, you know, project uh, uh, over the over the two years where it's not just one night in the opera house or one night in the lyric, where, where you know professionals, uh, producers, actors, and so on, um, and technicians from the theatres are working with young people in your community on a longer term basis so that there's more embedding of the outreach and just a sort of flash in the pan. Yeah, I think that would be that would be an excellent idea. Um, especially if you look at um, you know the high numbers of young people not in education, employment and training. Um, because then it could be a whole, a real holistic package where you could be looking at real training opportunities in creative industries, real training opportunities and apprenticeships, as Ryan has mentioned, around um, perhaps event management, technical, technical side, as well as the, the performing side. Um, so it, I think we would definitely welcome those suggestions for ourselves. Um, while there have been one-off opportunities to attend performances, and as I've said, that feeds into the young people's own artistic practice and development, yeah. um, it would be great then to have... I'm not saying, I'm not saying that you, you, you reject the yeah. thing completely. Mm -hmm. in, in addition to, it would yeah. be great to have those opportunities. We prefer to think of collaborations as, on, as ongoing relationships. Um, you know, like for instance, the, the project that we um, completed with the Austrian Museum, which was part of a national portrait gallery mm. programme. Um, We've continued that um, conversation and that relationship to look at other ways of um, developing work moving forward. So we would see that as 
that project started off a relationship that we want to continue. continue. So definitely we would be open to that because, um, yeah, it's, it's about creating working relationships that, that are longer than just yeah. the length of the project. The um, procurement process here where you know, companies get government contracts, like for example, the contract to build Windsor Park or Casement Park or the new stand at Ravenhill, they have what's called social clauses built into them where they have to take on a certain number of apprenticeships and employ a certain number of people who have perhaps been long-term unemployed, or so, uh, et cetera. Do you think that it would be useful, I think Mr Hilditch was, was hinting at something along these lines, that uh, do you think it would be useful if, if there were social clauses built in, to, as you say, into the funding arrangements for the arts here? Yes, very much so. It would so. be helpful, yeah. It would be very helpful. Yes. It would help us do our job. It would help us. It would make our job a lot easier. Yeah. Right. Uh, and if, what, what would you see, just briefly, as the advantages of that? Well, if there were social clauses around, for instance, ticketing, or um, you know, having to pr provide so so many reduced rate or free tickets, the advantages to us is it's opening venues up to young people that they would never have accessed before. When we did bring. Um, the, when the young people were performing in the opera house, I was talking to parents outside, and they had never been in the opera house before. And you know, it's a venue that is open to the whole country and further afield. So, um, yes, I think social clauses then would allow us to open young people's imaginations, feed their own work, but also give them, you know, the aspirations to be on that stage themselves, or create work to be hung in that gallery themselves or whatever. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and would you go further and say that the type of thing that we were speaking about a few minutes ago, you know, prolonged outreach, you know, outreach projects which, which lasted a year to two years and so on, that that could be built into those social clauses yes. as well? Yes, those outreach programmes built into social clauses would be excellent, but I think they also have to have a framework for around how um, they're de developed, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, so that there are clear partnership agreements there, that it's not just a tick box and exercise, that it's not just um, a venue perhaps with an, an idea of what they feel the arts should be, mm. that they're open to our ideas, um, and yeah. that it's not just about perhaps an elite idea yeah. of more highbrow art, you know, that there's an opportunity for there's an agreement between the two, the two partners yes. who are involved in it. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, you say in your, in your paper that uh, in your experience many people from many people from working class and disadvantaged communities feel that the arts and arts venues in particular are not for them. Um, often program, programming does not appeal uh, and so on. Are you breaking down that perception? Do you get the feeling that what you're doing is making progress in breaking down that percep perception? Yes. I think we've got two examples of young people that have already, in, within their um, presentations, alluded to that, um, where there were venues that they might, might have felt that they belonged or felt comfortable going to before. They're now happy to actually perform in those venues. Um, so yes, definitely our work. Do you want to come in on that? Our work has definitely opened up spaces to young people that they now feel is theirs, and rightly so. It's their city. Yeah. So it's important that those venues are are. I think it, it, theirs. as we said, we, we do bring young people to the likes of the Opera House and Mac, the Lyric, um, to see various shows throughout the year. You know, we had the young people using Cavelin again, um, went to see Macbeth, the opera. Now, something that, um, maybe as well as that, it's not maybe something they would necessarily want to go and see, but again, we're bringing them to see things that they kind of challenge their imagination and giving them new experiences. Um, and just one example that, that I remember is um, back at Christmas time, we took a group of 
young people, sort of 68 year olds, down to see the Mac, the show on the Mac. And when one young person walked around the corner, like her eyes just like lit up. It's like, like what is this place? Like really? And 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 it's five minute walk from her house, and it's somewhere that she probably would never have had. Um, her parents probably would never have brought her there, or even no one had existed. So it is like, and you know, I was like, oh, you, know, you could see the excitement um, on her face, a little sort of five year old. So it's those experiences that we um, we want to continue seeing with the young people, making them realise that they are these venues are for them, and uh, that means that we're the the people who have to bring them. Then we'll continue to do that. So. And just one thing, um, you know, when, when young people are, are performing at the various venues that you have available locally, and in some cases at the, the bigger arts venues downtown, as you might say, um, are you able to engage their families to come out and watch them and support them and be part of the audience? Yes, in the majority of cases. Um, but there are some cases where their where their parents don't come along, and that's because of other issues that they may have um, social social issues. There's a lot of issues that we're dealing with. Um, you know, there's parents who you know um, who are dependent on prescription drugs and mental health issues and different things. So there are examples of very very hard mm -hmm. and sad examples. Yeah. where yeah. we have young people performing and no one has come to watch them. Know, yeah. But in the majority of the cases, there are. And for us, it's about everyone making that experience special for the, pe the young people that are on stage because we want them to come off feeling 10 feet high. Ten feet high. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So if you have uh, 2,000 young people involved, there's, there's a sort of an added value beyond that because yes. you're drawing in their <coughs> families as well to... Um, support them, watch the performances, be part of the audience. Yeah, and, and come along to those venues, like I mentioned, in terms of the Opera House, come down to that. Or um, we had young people exhibit um, photography, exhibit artwork in Belfast Exposed, actually as part of Culture Night two years ago. Um, forgotten about that one. Mm -hmm. um, and the families come along as well. So coming into a gallery, um, walking in through the doors right, yeah. can be a bit intimidating sometimes. Yes, yes. Um, and coming and even going to the Austrian Museum and going and seeing their work ex mm -hmm. exhibited there. You know, we had one young person who came away from that and on Facebook had put, um, "Can't believe me coming from the flats. My work's in the museum." Yes. You know that lift uh -huh. of confidence, that lift yes. of self-belief, and the amount of comments she got from her peers and also from family members about how proud they were of her. Um, so yeah. It's very much about um, the ripple effect of the work that we do. Right. Look, thanks very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Mr. McCorley. Good morning, Hurley. Um, thanks very much, Chair, and thank you very much for the presentation. Very impressive. And um, it was great to hear from <coughs> Ryan and Cavelin, who you know are people who have actually benefited and flowered as a result of involvement with the New Lodge Arts. Uh, and that makes actually a big difference. Um, I suppose I'm going to touch on some things that previous members have touched on as well. Um, th this idea about feeling out of place in arts venues and then introducing people to them. Do you find that um, everyone responds positively uh, and changes their mind or some people still feel after having gone to places, mm, it's not for me? I think with everything in life, it's not going to, you know, no matter what it is, not everything's going to be for everyone. Um, we would be quite um, careful about what we would bring young people to for their first experience of it. We would do a lot of research around what the um, performance is or what the exhibition is to try and make it um, as, you know, to make sure it's as relevant to them that they're going to want to have a second experience. Um, but yeah, there sometimes you know we've brought. I, I know I've brought young people to see a contemporary dance performance before, and it wasn't for the young people. They just were like, "What's going on on the stage?" Um, it was a bit strange for them. And now they went along to see a drama performance a few weeks after it, and they um, absolutely loved it. So there are things, but it's the same as myself going to see performances. Um, we've even like I remember when we first started, we brought a group of young people who were who were involved in filmmaking, and they didn't think of it as drama because that wouldn't have been really that cool for them to do. But they were creating this film, and um, there was an, 
it was a wee bit of a risk, but there was a performance in the OMAC as it was then um, that I thought this will really make an impact on them. But I thought, how am I going to get them through? So we went in a magical mystery bus tour and ended up in an art gallery. They went in and they, they saw the, an exhibition, first of all, and then saw a performance and wanted to go back the next day. But they said to me, we would never have went in. If you had have told us, we wouldn't have turned up. So, you know, sometimes there's a wee bit of... Well, it's, it's measured because we're um, measured risk taking because we're really doing a lot of research into what's going to be relevant for young people so they have a positive experience of it. Um, but there are times that we'll bring them to see things and it just won't be for them. Mm -hmm. um, as Anne had mentioned previously um, about bringing young people to the opera and to ballet, I remember once bringing young people, it was when the waterfront did their reduced rate um, ticketing scheme in a much bigger scale than they do now and we brought 50 young people to see Swan Lake and I thought how is this going to go down and you know if it doesn't go down so well in the interval we can we can go or whatever as as anyone would have that choice and they loved it they came out and um, you know dancing around like um, and and since that we now have like two or three ballet classes happening yeah. so it's it's feeding that sort of yeah, actually, I was very impressed to hear about your ballet classes. I think it's the first time I've ever heard of ballet classes in a local community project. So well done. I mean, you sound like you've really pushed the boat out in terms of um, breaking down the exclusive feeling that maybe people might have. And I think actually you're actually proving the point that, uh, and, and this inquiry that we are doing into working class exclusion from the arts, it's not about. Um, it's once you break those barriers down and open people up to it, everybody will find something there that they enjoy. Because I think everybody from whatever walk of life will like some things and won't like others. Um, but can I just ask, uh, do you see the lower price seating thing and you're saying it's more about filling empty seats? Have you challenged them on that? Because that's an um, important point. Probably not as much as we could have. Okay, I mean, I think it's a question maybe that we could raise you yeah. know, as a committee because I think you're making an important point. Um, the other uh, thing I was going to say, the Mac Theatre would be probably on your doorstep yeah. and uh, they were here last week and they gave us a very impressive uh, presentation on what they do. Have you had direct engagement with them about how they can help cater for your needs and facilitate what you, what you need as a group? We've had um, some experience with, with the MAC. Uh, we have had discounted tickets for the Christmas show, um, but it didn't include transport. So again, then we um, pay for the transport then to get the children and young people there. And I, I think with that scheme, they had, had transport for other groups, but that wasn't be all used up. So then it puts a kind of onus on us then to, to find the funding to bring the kids to and from the building. Um, they also offered us space within their den to use as a, as a kind of free a free space for or the likes of our event management, which are young people aged sort of 17 to 19 to come down and use. And for us, it was kind of like, well, you know, why why would the young people come down here just to use a space? Is we need to have more kind of approach with with um, and also for the young people to get something out of going. So um, Ryan, along with our youth arts worker worked with the, the outreach um, officer in the MAC okay. and they developed a programme to look at the kind of goings on in the MAC, the backstage um, experiences like looking at sound and lighting, looking at marketing and they developed a programme over eight weeks, twelve, twelve weeks to, to get a, a kind of feel of what goes on within yes. an arts organisation. So that was I suppose a, a, um, an opportunity for us to give the young people a different experience as opposed to just going down and using their room. Okay. Um, so, so they were getting to kind of see what goes on in the MAC and also then for, because we have young people who have maybe performed and aren't maybe as interested in performing anymore but maybe interested in the sound and lighting or um, front of house etc. So it was an opportunity for them to, to learn learn about the MAC. So that's, that's I'd say that's a uh, much of our experiences, we've but get the sense that you nice. feel it could be you could get more from them. I think we could, there's probably more opportunity to collaborate, but I think as well to put it into context, we're a very small organisation. We've, you know, um, I'm working currently um, with New Lodge Arts and also with New Lodge Youth Centre, and Anne's um, full time 
and then the rest of the employees are all, there's um, five now, including Ryan, are all part-time. So what we're doing, you know, is we're doing a vast amount of work, mm -hmm. and the majority of our works and programmes. So we're trying, we're, we're doers, but then that's, just, that's the same for anyone that works in the community. You know, for us, it's about the arts as a tool for youth development, for community development. We're on the ground, we're firefighting, we're dealing with whatever issue comes up, as well as trying to plan and be strategic. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about, for us as well, making the most of the opportunities to collaborate whenever they come up. And sometimes as well, you know, we do think there are bigger organisations that have a lot more staff and a lot more capacity could perhaps make, take a few more steps um, towards engaging. Um, but, yeah, we I would, think... We would love to, to bring a showcase to the, the MAC over a couple of nights when, you know, you are main stage, but the cost is prohibitive for us. And if we can get a venue within the local community for a fraction of the price, we have to, we have, because we want to put so much of our funding into programming and the activities for the young people, we can't really justify spending thousands of pounds to a couple of thousand maybe to hire a venue, including the technical support, etc. that comes with, with hiring space. Yes, we can use a, a local um, church hall such as St Kevin's, which we use on a number of occasions, which um, <coughs> takes a lot of uh, work to get it, to get it um, functioning, but we have to weigh that up against cost, against um, you know, delivering the programmes that we do, and the programme activity wins every time for us, so if there was um, built within the, the these bigger venues, a percentage of nights I had to go free to community organisations. We would definitely welcome that um, opportunity because we're not going to be like other organisations who go in and charge about ten, fifteen pound a ticket. Like our tickets at the most, we like we couldn't even charge five pound for a ticket. So at the most uh, we could push it to three, um, but that would never cover costs for using the likes of the Mac or um, any any other venue. So that's something that we would definitely welcome because we would love to have a couple of nights in the Mac because people could walk down. It's, you know they don't have the transport barriers and uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of other people like that five year old who walked around the corner and into yeah. St Anne's Square mm -hmm. and was just mm -hmm. blown away by it. So well, the first time I went into St Anne's Square, I was like, mm -hmm. yeah. didn't know this place was here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I can understand how somebody might feel that way. Just one last question. Um, Ryan, Keir and Kevlin obviously have come on and developed talents that maybe they weren't aware of as a result of working with your group. Would you say there's much untapped talent out there that, that could be, you know, developed and you just don't, if there's enough resources, let's say, to do it? Definitely, there's a lot of untapped talent. Like, um, we have, and it's it's about consistent um, delivering. It's not about going in and doing a one-year programme. It's about working with those young people right along and then feeling a sense of belonging and feeling um, supported and nurtured. Um, for instance, we have a, a young man now um, who went through several of the programmes. One of the programmes um, in drama that I mentioned earlier, looking at, at um, drug awareness and xen xenophobia, he is now in New York and he's performing over there. And that he said he never would have thought that he would, well, let alone be in New York, but never would have thought that drama or acting was something he would have been interested in until he started making a film about an issue-based piece. Um, so there's a lot of potential. There's a lot of untapped potential, um, I would definitely say. And there's a lot of potential within our young people, like Caitlin mentioned, um, taking part in our activities, but she's also then had the confidence to go on and take part independently of New Lodge Arts mm -hmm. within the Opera House. And there's others that have went on mm -hmm. to Music Theatre for Youth, for instance, and, and worked with them. So, yes, there's a lot of untapped talent. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Mr. Irwin. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for your presentation. I suppose most things have been fairly well covered, but there, there, there seems to be a physiological barrier preventing working class um, engagement with arts. Is that what you see that can be done to, to overcome this? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, there seems to be phys physiological barriers uh, preventing working class engagement with the arts, okay? Mm -hmm. Is that what you can do or is that what can be done to overcome that barrier? You know, 
I think um, like something that we are keen to do is with, with our Arts Academy programme, it is focused with the, the New Lodge <coughs> area. We run the Taster programmes <coughs> across North Belfast and <coughs> various, like from White City to Westland <coughs> to Ardoin, um, um, Mount Vernon, all around. And But we are kind of going in, delivering maybe 12 weeks of programme and coming out again, getting another pot of funding from somewhere to, to go in again and do and kind of meet the needs. Now, what those groups have said is that they would welcome a, a, a year-round programme of activities that we could be going in and delivering. Um, may it be hip-hop um, every Monday in Mount Vernon or um, uh, drama in, in, in Westland. But at the minute, we, we don't have the funding to extend that programme. It's something that we are working on. We were um, very hopeful to get a, the funding through Esme Fairburn and on Unfortunately, it was unsuccessful. So we do think that there are needs within these communities, and we will work um, over the next sort of few months to try and, and raise more funding because uh, a lot of the, these areas have, have kind of little arts infrastructure. And uh, the thing that we find is that the, the young people who take part enjoy what we're doing and uh, want more. So we uh, would love to be able to give that to them, but at the minute, within our kind of capacity and, and funding, we, we can't. So. Yeah, with more Fulton, you could do more. Yeah, well, yeah we could. Okay. Okay. Everybody saying that. <laughs> Mr. M Mr. McMillan. Yes, and thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Okay. Um, the one thing I see missing from your your presentation is no mention of disability. Uh, okay. okay. Well, we um, we work. Well, there's a couple of examples. I'll come from uh, sort of within uh, our program. We work with the 174 Trust. Um, based in Don the Don Curran Centre, and we've worked with them for many years. They have actually three disability groups. One is sort of under 10, <coughs> another one 10 to 18, and the third and 18 plus. So we've had various examples of working with this group and um, delivering um, drama projects, visual art projects um, throughout the years. And our most recent project uh, we delivered through a taster um, project with the council and uh, we delivered photography workshops with the three individual groups. So we put a, a photographer in who uh, worked with the groups individually and then brought them together for a final celebration night where we exhibited in the new Dunkern Arts Centre and we exhibited all their work. So there was, I think there was about 60, 62 images that the, that the young people and adults had all taken as part of this project. And uh, they were on display then for an evening with family and friends to come and see their work. And uh, I suppose from my point of view, um, that programme was uh, a real success. And even the, the parents were so excited to be able to come in and see work that their young people had, had been involved in, in, um, in, in working on because the, the projects themselves have very little funding and they don't have that many opportunities to involve the families with, the, with what the young people have been doing. So to come to this celebration evening, it was a real um, highlight uh, for the group. And since then, we have then implemented a weekly program with, with the disability groups where they come and use the New Lodge Youth Centre on a Friday night. And from there on, there we offer a range of different arts activities and also some sport activities as well. Again, like what we, uh, the core of what we do is addressing the needs of the young people and what the young people want to do. So we've been working with the groups to, to continue to develop that. I think it's also fair to say, if I could just come in on that, all our programmes are fully inclusive. So regardless of a young person's ability or disability, the programmes are open for them to come and participate in and we will meet their needs as best we can while they're involved in that programme. I think it would be more to your benefit if that was highlighted. Okay. I'm quite amazed at the amount of work that you do from the base that you have. And I don't think you're blowing your trumpet loud enough. We don't have the likes of that there, I think that's... Uh, an omission that you should have in okay. because I, I, I've listened to bigger groups and quite honestly that I'm not a non quarter for the disability that you have just told me and um, just to finish with saying like Molly dancing the New Lodge Road <laughs> <laughs> certainly a new one <laughs> be welcome to come along and see it. <laughs> well done I, I'm very impressed with you thank you very thank much you. you need to purchase a, a trumpet Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Humphrey. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks very much for your presentation. Thank you. <coughs> Just listening to, to um, oh, yeah. 
uh, Katrina, you were saying that about confidence and, and young people feeling out of place. Um, it's probably, and you know, I, I'm impressed to hear the amount of work that's being done to address that, and that has been done on examples from from Rad and, and you know, in terms of how they uh, have actually been able to take part uh, where previously there were barriers. Whenever I suggested to the committee a number of months ago that we do this piece of work, there was a sort of a, a reaction from the establishment and some within the media that there wasn't an issue. Uh, and and I listened carefully to what you said and, and the outreach that's been done in 25 community groups, um, I think you said Anne, and 16 schools, you know, all of that's tremendously good <coughs> um, because it needed to be done because there is an issue and your presentation here today uh, confirms that. Um, but can I ask you, um, Ran, you said that um, you got involved because it was on your doorstep yeah. and because you, if it hadn't been on your doorstep, coming from the background that you and I both come from, you would have felt out of place. C can you expand on that a wee bit? Um, yeah. I think if I if I have went out of like the new lodge, the summer like other uh no like in, into the town, but and the no like a venue that, that that I didn't know or I would have felt like I wouldn't like wouldn't be allowed to be here if someone had said something, I probably I'd have just died <laughs> um, of embarrassment. <laughs> um, so I I just wouldn't have done it like in case someone had said something, um, I would have felt really intimidated. Um, but now, if I were to go somewhere, it wouldn't even it wouldn't even phase me, because um, they've grown up. <laughs> yeah, and so, out of that experience, you've got the confidence to go along. Um, but it's fair to say that had you not had uh, the facilities and the opportunities in your area, in the new lodge, then you all of that's happened. You and all of the experiences you've had and the confidence you've gained wouldn't have happened. Yeah, definitely, because. If the you know, Sharks weren't bringing us out and taking us places um, other other than the new lodge, well then I, then I wouldn't have left. So I and then I wouldn't have grew the confidence to go out because they were taking me out different places. And I was like, all right, well maybe I can go out. And maybe I can go in here. And nothing would be said. So and then after that, it's just um, it built up and built up, and now I'm happy. <laughs> can I just say, chair, in relation to you were talking about venues. Um, and you know, venues, larger bit, <coughs> venues in the city centre could be used by yourselves. You should have a word with Belfast City Council because I'm fairly confident that in the clause that was negotiated for the money that went into the refurbishment of the Ulster Hall, there are a certain number of nights a year set aside that the community gets access to the Ulster Hall. Okay, that would be that would be um, brilliant. The some of the considerations we need to take on in relation to that then, um, which is fantastic to have that, but then is also thinking about the technical side of it and whether when we go into those venues if we have to use their own technical yeah. assistance. And sometimes that can be you know, a few thousand pounds in itself, so then that knocks it out where we could use the local sort of church hall and try and sure. do the... Equipment ourselves, it wouldn't be anywhere as good. But you know, and even yeah. even catering as well. We know that sometimes when you're using the likes of the Ulster Bowl, you have to use their in-house caterers. <coughs> or then, into, if you've got 80 kids performing, you're into hundreds of pounds. Whereas we can make sandwiches or hot noodles or whatever it might be. <laughs> Thanks very much. So those, those are some of the real barriers. And um, you know, we bring young people to perform, but we also need to provide food for them because a lot of them are if they're coming along. They're maybe coming straight from school or they haven't had anything to eat. So we're either bringing <coughs> someone in to do catering or we're making sandwiches or providing fruit or whatever. So thank you. So, thank you. Um, no one else has, has indicated. Can I thank you for your time this morning? Thank and you very much. Thank you. Your experiences and uh, the very positive work that you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much for your time. Thank, thank you. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Presentation and it's from the Spectrum Centre. Again, if you look at the Mark's memo, 
at page 151 and the Spectrum Centre's written submission to the inquiry at page 158. Marvin Bell, who's the general manager, and Bobby Foster, who's the program manager. And can I just ask you to make an opening statement, and then members will follow up with some questions. Thanks, Chair. That'll be uh, that'll be me doing most of the talking initially, and then Bobby and I'll take the questions together, if that's okay. Can I just get some water because I know I'm going to probably need it. First and foremost, good morning, and, and thank you for the opportunity to make a verbal presentation to the committee. Um, the Spectrum Centre certainly wel welcomes the opportunity to do so uh, and to add to our, our written submission. Um, as you said, my name is Mervyn Bell, I'm the General Manager. Uh, I've been at the Spectrum for just over a year, and this is uh, Bobby Foster. Bobby's a Programme Manager uh, at the Centre. Um, we thought it would be useful just to give you some contextual information first um, on the Spectrum Centre itself. Um, the idea for a flagship uh, centre on the Shankill Road was the in inspiration of the Greater Shankill Partnership. Um, the partnership then secured funding from the Millennium Commission and the International Fund for Ireland in the late 1990s, and the centre officially opened in 2001. Uh, it was originally conceived of as a facility which would focus primarily, although not exclusively, uh, on young people and the arts. Culture and heritage would be essential elements of a varied menu of activity to young people. <coughs> Uh, for a variety of reasons, the, the centre couldn't be sustained as a youth facility so <coughs> and in latter years has developed into a facility with a core arts, culture uh, and heritage offer, underpinned by a very strong community development ethos and approach uh, and serving all sections of the community. Although we do have a, a, a particular focus on children and young people, women and older people. The centre is also currently working with other organisations, individuals in the City Council to contribute to the tourism agenda. Um, again trying to focus on, on cultural tourists um, so we're continually evolving adapting uh, and, and don't stand still um, the center is, is a large building that people have, have ever been uh, boasts a main auditorium which can seat 300 people two smaller meeting and conference rooms dedicated arts room and a fully equipped uh, dance studio um, in addition the center is seven shop fronts two floors of office accommodation and a restaurant and cafe and you'll see the importance of that a little bit uh, in a minute um, as noted in our written submission, our mission is to provide a focused programme and facility for arts, culture and heritage and tourist activity in the Greater Shankill area, um, enabling community development through engagement, participation, education or appreciation. And we fulfil this through the goals and objectives we outlined in the written submission. Um, and we believe that this mission and these objectives are fit for the community we serve uh, and very much resonate with the currently, current policy drivers for the committee, the assembly and the executive as a whole. Our thrust of social inclusion and community regeneration are evidenced in our location and our work, uh, and I'll move on to our core activity uh, very shortly. As noted, the, the commercial property element of the centre is, is a core aspect of our financial strategy, uh, alongside grants from a wide range of funders, uh, specifically from the City Council and the Arts Council, um, although in the last 12 18 months we've also drawn down project funding from Department of Foreign Affairs, Community Relations Council, Ulster Scots Agency, Belfast Strategic Partnership and Lloyds, Lloyds Foundation, and that's uh, only a few of the, of the funding partners there. In the current economic climate, both uh, regionally and nationally, it's fair to say that we face continuing pressures and challenges, as I suspect most uh, organisations do. In terms of the central theme of the inquiry, uh, just again some additional contextual information, if that's okay. Um, we see ourselves very much as a grassroots organisation. Um, we do not and would not envisage competing with some of the core arts uh, and cultural venues in Belfast City Centre. I uh, believe our location and our ethos and approach of being at the very heart of a community is essential in fulfilling our mission, mission and enabling the transformational power of arts and culture 
to be experienced by community members. The majority of our staff team are local to and drawn from the local community. The majority of centre users are the same in terms of drawn from the local community. Um, and that we feel the importance and power of relationships can't be understated in terms of drawing people in to activities and events uh, and of allowing and enabling that first or that sustained engagement in arts and cultural activity to, to happen. This again underpins and supports our grassroots approach. Uh, we offer arts, culture, heritage and increasingly those tourist activities and events through a wide, varied and ever-expanding programme. Um, but we also focus greatly on community engagement and community development. We do this fundamentally by ensuring our physical location is supplemented by relationships with the, the community and by relationships with, and networks with other organisations and groups within Greater Shankill. Um, and in, again, increasingly with organisations and groups beyond the Greater Shankill area as well. Um, we're proactive in providing that rich and varied menu, but we're also proactive in opening up the centre as a community facility uh, and resource. Um, so, for example, we, we, we house Greater Shankill Partnership, Integrated Services for Children and Young People. We have Citizens Advice, Women in Sport, Bryce and Future Skills, and a residence art studio in our shop fronts. Um, and we're used by the likes of Olympus Dance Group, Shankill Area, Social History Group, Glenwood Army Cadets, Heel and Ankle Community Theatre Group, again, just to name a few of the community groups who are in and, and, and using the building. Um, our written submission focused very much on three examples um, of how we've sought to translate all of that ab uh, above context in, into, into practice. Um, and successfully, we, we believe, in terms of the examples that we, that we shared, um, and perhaps a little less on the theory or, or research or discourse uh, on the inclusion of different sections uh, of a population in, in the arts per se. Um, but we, we hope to say a little bit more about that now in, in terms of our, our, our verbal submission. In terms of the rest of our opening statement to the committee, we'd like to elaborate on some of the key points that we did make in our written submission and add some real and lived detail to the philosophy and context that we, that we outlined. Um, we have a core arts, culture, heritage program throughout uh, uh, the year. Um, within the last 12 months, this has included the culmination of <coughs> creative writing project, which uh, realised 11 public performances of a community play called Crimea Square, continuation of dedicated arts groups for children, young people and, and for women, creative writing classes, master classes with established artists, including Joe Egan, Moira Donaldson, Martin Lynch and Heather Richardson, print workshops with C Court Print, music and singing workshops with Moving on Music, um, and on the heritage side, um, a range of historical exhibitions, looking at ma uh, Mackey's uh, artifacts and memorabilia around uh, the cruise ship Cranborough, centenary of the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force, local history classes at Shankill Women's Centre and St. Mary's Ch uh, St. Matthew's Church, and work with local primary schools on World War I, uh, including the creation of, a, of an information booklet for, for children to use. From November of last year, we secured funding for a 20-hour week arts development officer post, uh, which was exactly what we needed, as that's enabled a whole raft uh, of outreach activity to take place. Um, and just more recent, most recently, this has included work with Edenbrook Primary School Parents Group, uh, and then with school children themselves looking at designing creation of healthy eating murals, Grove Day Centre and Clifton Residential Home, Denwood Primary School and Cave Hill Primary School, all who accessed uh, um, open Arts Gamelan, which is an Indonesian orchestra, uh, and then work with Clifton Nursing Home around music and singing workshops. Um, and that Arts Development Officer has been at the core of formulating those relationships and allowing that outreach activity to, to happen. Partnerships and collaborations uh, have also extended our, our core programme. Um, as mentioned there, this is included with Open Arts. They've brought the Gamelan, the Indonesian orchestra, to the spectrum for a two-month uh, residency. That's included a range of workshops with schools and community groups and then a public performance. Um, with Etcetera Theatre Group, uh, sorry, the Etcetera Theatre Company, uh, two performances of their play, uh, Tartan. With Spanner in the Works, they brought a performance of Diablo uh, on behalf of Shankill Women's Centre. That's a play focusing on human trafficking uh, and sexual exploitation. And they also had a performance of Popping Candy, and that was via Decal's Creativity Month. Um, we've worked with Verbal Arts Centre, they brought a public performance of Crows on the Wire, um, a, uh, a play looking at the transition from uh, RUC to PSNI. Um, we've worked with Armagh Planetarium, um, had two school sessions again, part of Creativity Month. Um, and we've worked with Crescent Arts Centre, uh, so we were able to participate in City Dance 
2014. Partnership work, work remains uh, another developing area. Um, we're working currently with Anne Culture Land on the Falls Road to deliver the flagship project of Creative and Cultural Belfast Fund. Uh, it's a project looking at the River Farset. Um, we have an emerging partnership with New Lodge Arts, obviously you've just heard from, uh, looking at developing a cross-community intergenerational project, bringing young people and older people together, um, and a strengthening partnership with Conway Mill, um, working uh, there with, with, uh, older, uh, with women's group in particular. Um, these partnerships are crucial, we believe, in terms of the work we do. Uh, there's a shared cross-community element, there's a shared uh, affinity of location and approach, and we're finding those relationships are crucial in terms of what we're, what we're doing. What this has meant is that we're able to attract and engage a very wide audience, uh, a cross-section of the community, but with a continued focus on children and young people, women, and increasingly older people, but literally all members of the community. As part of our core funding from the City Council, uh, we have some targets to meet. Uh, for 2013-2014, this included a, a target of having 13 artist or practitioner contracts. We had 31 for the period. Um, we had a target of 40, uh, sorry, 400 volunteer hours. We managed to, to, to reach 548. Uh, we had a target of 250 individual participants. We had 636. Uh, and we had a target of uh, a total audience figure of 4,000. It was the only one we missed. We had 3,069 3, for, for that period. Um, all of that hopefully paints a very sort of positive picture of uh, and, and sort of conveyed some of the enthusiasm, passion, and energy and commitment we have um, in terms of arts and cultural activity. But we are confronted on a daily basis with the pressures and challenges of delivering arts, culture, and heritage activity in a working class community uh, and for the Spectrum Centre within very much a Protestant working class community. And probably this gets to the very essence of, of the committee's inquiry. Um, although just a small aside, we do have a, a problem in terms of using sort of probably sweeping generalizations in terms of working class and arts. Um, although perhaps that's probably been raised and articulated by other people, so we'll, we'll not get into a great debate and discourse around those. What we do want to do is probably articulate some of the the, the pressures and challenges that we believe we face uh, and how we try and uh, counter those on a daily basis. Um, first and foremost, an individual or a community's social upbringing, um, its previous engagement with arts and cultural activity, its recognition uh, of, the, of the importance and value of the arts, um, almost a part of the ethos or the psyche of a working class community um, that might not be there as readily as other sections uh, or, or other communities. Um, so we have a challenge in terms of how we, we bring people into an, art, an arts and cultural experience if that experience isn't already grounded there within a family situation or a community situation. There's an issue in terms of an access to opportunity uh, and for opportunities to be seen as accessible uh, and again not the preserve of a particular section of the community. There are simple logistical issues of location, cost, advertising and programming and how that reaches into um, particular communities. There are challenges on the choices that individuals or communities uh, might make if faced with lower disposable income and how they pri prioritise using their income. Um, and again, a, a, a perception on the value placed on, on, on choices that might be made, particularly if that choice is not to engage in, in arts and cultural activity. And we know that's made harder by the continuing impact of the recession, um, both on individuals and on, on organisations like ourselves. A lot of our activity is free at the point of delivery. Uh, as a means of engaging and, and encouraging uh, community to, to, to engage. We feel sometimes there's an absence of strong role models to challenge some of the, the, the perhaps social perceptions, and again, they might be more gender-based, uh, of engagement in the arts in, in working class communities, and we're doing an awful lot of work uh, with community members, and you'll see that through the, the exemplar of Crimea, Crimea Square, uh, where we had two men, two women, writing community members, writing a play, um, and we made a great, uh, a great part of, 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 of relaying that to the community in terms of there were very strong role models that, that, that people should look at and, and, and sort of aspire to. Um, a, a danger perhaps in, inherent in the politi politicization of culture um, and again a need for us to convey and relay culture in its widest sense. Um, a real challenge and pressure of being prepared to graft and put some hard work in. Um, for us, a need to get face-to-face -face with the community to engage and enthuse and involve. Um, 
we do an awful lot of work in terms of building up relationships uh, to, to, to again to bring people into to the activity we offer. And I guess there's something around the articulation of the value uh, of arts and giving individuals the opportunity to experience this firsthand. We're absolutely delighted now that young people who've been involved in our young people's group, the Art Den, um, they talk confidently and matter-of-factly about the MAC or about Culture Night because they've experienced that and they've been involved in, in that. Um, and we see the transformational power of, um, of, of the arts on a community. Um, we went at great pains when we were delivering Crimea Square to, to ask people to feedback and we got a range of feedback from people who just come in to, to, to observe and, and to engage in the play. And I'm just going to read you two, uh, just to, to, to give you an idea of that what a meaning by sort of trans transformational power. Um, this is a person who just called themselves Molly. And uh, he said, you all did something very special tonight. You expressed pride without arrogance and self-belief without judgment of others. Well done to all involved. It was class. Um, and a second person, no name on this one, but amazing what can evolve through creative writing group and the telling of local history. It's great to see community actors and professionals coming together to create great drama. Um, now, I'm assuming you've had a chance to, to read the, the written submission, but obviously Crimea Square was a community play that, that marked 100 years of the social history of the Shankill Road. So we were, we were bringing arts and culture together uh, in a pretty interesting mix, and it was good that people, public members who came in and viewed that play were able to, to, to sort of recognize that and feedback accordingly. Um, fundamentally, we seek to bring the benefits of participation in the arts to the greater Shankill community, individuals, the community, and the wider society. For us, it's as much about processes as it is about products. Um, having an extensive program, engaging people, producing artwork, these are all important, for, but for us, they're almost ends in themselves. The processes are equally, if not more, important. Generating that interest and spark, enabling people to access activities and experiences for the first time, generating the confidence and stimulating belief, sustaining interest, seeing people enthuse other people. These are all qualitative outcomes that we see in our work. Um, I'm reminded again of, of, of sort of Crimea Square. It happened just as I was uh, starting in, in the Spectrum Centre. Um, and there was a, a member of the community who had been part of the creative writing group. Um, they put together a promotional video um, to, to say to the public, this uh, play is coming, you've got to come and see it. Um, and this person inter introduced themselves in the video very succinctly as, I'm Sally and I'm a writer, um, which for us was, was just a very powerful statement. It wasn't she was a member of a community or she was a mother or a grandmother. She was a writer. And that was, uh, she probably only was able to say that after being involved in something <coughs> for two and a half years. For our community, it's this investment of time and energy which brings rewards and enables and allows the community itself to address some of the pressures and challenges I alluded to uh, earlier. There are some immediate returns, but equally this is about investing in the longer term future change. We believe we're building solid foundations in which solid and long-lasting walls can be built. Uh, processes, time, energy, commitment, resources, all essential elements. Um, we're not looking at imposing art on a community. Instead, we're finding ways of building ownership uh, where this community makes and participates in arts and culture for itself. Madam Chair, I've got a few minutes just to reiterate the recommendations I made in the, the, the verbal presentation. I just wanted to add a, a uh, sorry, written submission. I just wanted to add a few more lines to, to that. Um, and, and, and that'll conclude. Um, so we, we made some recommendations from our perspective uh, as very much a grassroots organization working at the heart of a, of a working class community. Um, we'd like the committee and the department to, to actively encourage those core and large scale arts and cultural uh, venues to support the work of smaller community based venues like ourselves. Um, we know there's been plenty of comment already on, on the larger arts venues uh, to, to the committee from a variety of people. Our contact and engagement has been positive, uh, but perhaps a little bit of proactivity with us as community-based organizations as a conduit to the community would be really helpful. Um, and that could be through joint initiatives, uh, joint projects, right through to formal partnership uh, arrangements. And we believe there should be proactive, appropriate, and sustained investment in community-based venues and activities. Um, having centers and projects in the heart of working class communities is vital, uh, but it brings a significant uh, financial challenge, which I face on a, on a daily basis, um, that there should be an appreciation of the inability or the unwillingness, perhaps, to pay, uh, but that should be tempered with an ability to produce a social return on investment. 
uh, namely that participation in arts and cultural activity, that access to personal and societal, but societal benefits that it brings. There should be an acknowledgement that community-based venues are more likely to be in contact with working class communities, more understanding of their needs, ideally placed to provide a menu of activity which all or different members, members of the community can engage in. Um, and again, a perfect conduit to more mainstream venues and activity. And finally, there needs to be a recognition that public, private uh, or philanthropic sectors are investing in processes as much as products. And these processes are crucial in enabling and sustaining participation in the arts. That concludes our opening statement, or verbal statement, and thank you for your patience <laughs> as I read through it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. That was, um, that was very useful. Um, we appreciate that very much. I've had the um, benefit of actually attending a number of performances at the Spectrum Centre, including um, Crimea Square, good, thank which you. Uh, I can highly recommend um, as, a, as a very good project um, based within the community. Yeah. Um, and you could see um, the, the joy um, that those who participated in actually got from that. Mm -hmm. and the benefits were, were, were very obvious that evening that I was there. So I congratulate you, you on that. Thank you. Um, and the building is very impressive. And, but I suppose what was quite, oh, what's very obvious about the two presentations that we've had today is that you are very much based within a building. Yes. Whereas New Lodge, I haven't, haven't got that luxury in many respects. Yeah. But at the same time, you, you deliver very similar projects, but just in, in a different way. That's right. Um, there are those who would say that a building can, in, in many respects, be an inhibitor mm -hmm. and a barrier. Um, the, the fact that you now have opened it up very much around community development, do you think that that's been of assistance to you in order to break down those barriers to get people then engaged then within the arts where they perhaps wouldn't have been before? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, one of the challenges I was uh, given when I, when I arrived um, was about developing that, that uh, community ownership and, and enabling us to, to continue to reach out. It's not to say that we've been there for... 12, 13, 14 years and, and not engaged with the community, not had people in. It's, it's been a, a movable, movable feast probably through that period. Uh, but certainly it was, it was one of our priority areas uh, to, to, to go out and be, be more proactive. Um, so we've sought to, to, to do that. And I guess trying to get people in to see the, the building and appreciate its benefits and to say, come and, come and use it. Um, so whilst we're putting on an activity program ourselves, we're also mindful that we can, we can enable organisations to do it. Um, if you ever pass the, the Spectrum Centre on a Tuesday night, be, be warned, uh, Olympus Dance Group take it over. Um, 300 young women from, from 5 to 18 coming in right through the evening. Um, and that's what the building needs to be used for. So we almost step back and say, there you go. <laughs> use the building. Uh, use it proactively, which they, which they do. Um, <clears throat> so that's... Uh, it can be an inhibitor. It isn't if we open it up and enable as many people to access it as possible. So we, we, we're doing that. But the outreach element is, is crucial as well, and that's why I, I sort of wanted to focus on that. Um, we have some fantastic staff, Bobby, Sally, the Arts Development Officer, who are out there in the community taking their skills and talents out there. Now, sometimes that's about groups coming back in again and using the activity, but also it's about us using our skills and resources and being, being there. So we're trying to make the centre at the, at the heart of the community. Um, but we're mindful that, that people don't necessarily need to come to us all the time. We need to be going, going out as well. Okay, so it's only really recently that you've had an arts development officer? In terms of a dedicated position, yes. We, we, um, the last two or three years, our main arts and culture funding has come through uh, the Project Lottery Strand of the Arts Council. Um, and we had uh, a couple of posts that would have been more facilitation posts, but we didn't have a developmental post. And we have had that since November. And even just in that, what, six, seven, eight months, uh, the, the, the change has, has been hugely noticeable in terms of what we've been able to do and the networks and, and relationships that we've been able to establish. And is that a temporary post or is that a full-time post? It's, it's, um, it's, it's tied up with the funding that we draw down from the, from the, the Arts Council. So we have submitted our uh, application for project lottery funding for... 1415. Um, we shall hear in a couple of weeks' time, hopefully. Uh, and we, we asked for the funding to be sustained for the post again. Um, we're also now looking at other grants, uh, so sorry, other foundations and trusts where we might be able to mainstream that, that post more readily. But at the minute, it's, it's, it's linked into our Arts Council funding. Okay. And just how broad is your reach geographically? 
Sorry. The how broad is your reach geographically? How broad is that reach? Our, our reach at the minute is, is very much the, the, the Greater Shankill area. So we would see that from the West Link right up to Highfield, Ballyshill, and Glencairn. That, that, that would be our definition. Um, although things like Crimea Square as a public performance then enabled people to come from, from across the province, we did a little postcode analysis for that. We were probably getting 50% of the audience from BT14, BT15, BT13, so or doorstep in essence. Um, but we were also getting right across the province and beyond. Um, so people who visitors to, to the, the city were, were, were coming in and accessing the, 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 the play as well. Um, the, the partnerships and the collaborations are also enabling us to, to move out. Um, I'm going to a steering group meeting tonight for the Creative and Cultural Belfast project conjunction with partnership with, with Culture Land. So we've got a, a cross-community steering group coming together to drive that, that project um, and hopefully deliver aspects of the project so that that expands or, or reach again into, into uh, a different and, and a new community for us. Okay. So we, ha we have a core, but we're, we're moving at the margins as well. Okay, and you made it quite clear that you don't wish to compete with the city centre venues, but you do see yourselves as, as a conduit to the community. Yeah. Um, do you have to make the approaches to those venues, or do they approach you? Um, in my experience, <clears throat> it's been we've probably had to be a little bit more proactive in terms of, 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 of making those, those links. I think the, the, the organisations are happier to come and ask us to, to, to run publicity materials and, and to, to make sure that we're aware of what they're, they're offering. But in terms of activity, um, for example, in our, our Arts Council bid this year, um, we put in a, a collaborative project with the MAC, um, but we we approached the MAC to say, can we can we do something here? Can we can we work with you to put a, a submission in and, and then secure some funding to run a project where we'll take members of the community down into the MAC and experience the activity there? Um, so so that's been a bit more. We've we've been pushing at it enough. Bobby wants to to add because he's got a bit more uh, longer history with with the spectrum yeah. in terms of whether that picture's changed. Yeah, in terms of. Um interacting with other arts groups. Uh, one of the negative experiences with the Spectrum Centre was about four to five years ago when we were uh, chasing the Ulster Orchestra coming to a concert for primary schools and they weren't available. Their calendar had been made up and we were getting this, that and a wee bit of the other. Uh, and then all of a sudden when this question started to raise its head, we had a phone call right out of the blue that the Ulster Orchestra wanted to come to the Spectrum Centre. Now, take out of that what you will. As soon as I got myself up off the floor, I asked Mervyn <laughs> when they were coming and what they were going to do. And I think it was a rehearsal for a Sunday they originally started with. Yeah. I filled in a Sunday with a choir of around <coughs> 80 people, mm -hmm. uh, which was fantastic for the centre, absolutely. But in terms of being surprised at that booking, you could have just blew me away. They did, they did do some workshops with schools um, as part of Creativity Month. Um, the, the, the pressure we had with Creativity Month was uh, <coughs> being asked to, to utilise funding very quickly. Um, and when we, we, we did our, our best to, to make that happen. And they ran some sessions as, as part of a... Uh, I think they were working with some schools um, in the Greater Shankill area and in the Colon area. And they came together as a, as a collaborative... Uh, performance at, at the end. So they, they ran some, some, as well as their own rehearsals, they, they did a few workshops as well, which was great. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Bradley. Thank you. Morning. 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 Uh, yeah. I just wanted to ask, uh, when the last group were in the New Lodge uh, Arts, we were, we were discussing the, you know, the uh, relationship between the larger organisations like the orchestras and the venues like the Lyric and the Opera House and so on with local arts groups. And uh, we made this sort of comparison between the um, social clauses that there are built into large government contracts, mm -hmm. like the stadia that are built and so on, <coughs> where a number of apprentices and uh, people who are, have been unemployed and so on are, are taken on to, to work in those contracts. Do you think that a model like that would be useful uh, to look at uh, regarding the relationship between organisations like yourselves and, say, the Lyric, the Opera House, the Ulster Orchestra, that built into their funding there would be some provision for that type of arrangement? I think it, it, something like that would be very helpful. 
I think, um, and we <coughs> to, to trial it and test it to see if it, if it did to determine the outcomes would be would be very interesting to, to, to see. Um, and there's a real tricky one, isn't there, in terms of you know do we do we expect a lot of people to go and access those those bigger or mainstream venues, um, and is that going to happen, or do we say perhaps we need to have a bit of a uh, foundation and a, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a grounding first before there's that almost natural uh, extension in, in, into more mainstream programs. Uh, I think we need to perhaps build up, up first rather than thinking. And if that means those organisations coming into, into communities and working closely with us, then so be it. That would be, that would be good as well. Uh, I think to expect people just to go and, and you know, access activity, I'm not, I'm not sure that's going to happen. No, uh you know, what, what we have been talking about was rather than sort of one-off visits or whatever. Yeah. More uh, sustained activity. More su Absolutely. sustained activity over, say, a year to two years, yeah. whatever. Yeah. Oh, thanks very much for that. And the other thing I was going to ask Ian about was the community group theatre. Uh -huh. how, how is it progressing? Very well. There's a, there's a tremendous energy. They were, they were uh, some of the morning last night on a creative writing class with, I shouldn't mention his name, but Martin Lynch was in the building last night. So... <laughs> We've heard of him already. Absolutely. I suspect that, I suspect that, that was the case. Um, so they, they, again, it's that just seeing the energy and the, and the passion and, and trying to f feed that and fuel that is, is, is our task at the minute um, because there are people who, who are chomping at the bit to do another play uh, and, and desperately wanting to write a play uh, and finding now the, the, the ways in which they can increase their knowledge and skills to, to do that. Okay. And, you know, when you get to the stage where you're ready to produce another play, do you use a, a local director or do you bring in a professional director? How does that work? I think that on, on that occasion for Crimea Square, they brought a professional in uh, purely for mm. direction mm. Uh, and to keep uh, the community uh, writers and actors yeah. on a balance. They also had professional actors there. But I think at the end of the day, it was the right blend of, of, of sort of a newcomer with experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're a football manager at all, that's the sort of team you want to send out, you know. England take note. But listen, uh, getting away from that. No, the community comics, the, the play Crimea Square was an absolutely blow away success. No doubt about it whatsoever. I think they've had a few offers about taking it taking on the right. road. Um, and it did, it used everybody. We had Mary Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Lynch, we'd, be, we'd done a thing on the suffrage, that's when Mary Jones came along and done a thing, we had a couple of uh, very esteemed doctors from Queen's University talking on women's rights and stuff like that, and that was something within our own area of the shankle that people had never given too much thought to, looking at the suffragette movement and stuff like that, and it was a real eye-opener because we then got people writing short stories about the suffragette movement, which was actually a break into the arts of people, you know, you give them the right sort of drive to do it, and they'll break into the arts without actually knowing or take participating in the arts. Oh, yes, yes, yes. One of the other aspects, just minded of it there in terms of, of, I suppose there's a danger in terms of just looking at participation, um, and I think we need to, to perhaps think about arts in terms of, of uh, members of our community being creators um, as well, um, and, and you know the fact that. that Members of the community are attending creative writing classes. They're, they're writing plays. They're writing poems. Um, they're getting some of the, the accolades that, that that work richly deserves. is, is fantastic. So it, it's not just about going and, and engaging and, and being a participant. It's actually turning that in its head so that <coughs> people are beginning to create. We had some for Crimea Square. There were some young people who acted as interns in terms of stage management, um, who are now going on to, to, to other bigger and better things. Um, and that's that. It's that that we're seeking to, that's the community development aspect, I suppose, and we're not just there as a venue, we're there as something that can build skills and confidence yeah. and an attitude with, yeah. within members of the community. And, yeah. uh, just a, oh, a quick word on that, and before Mervyn arrived, Mervyn, you're a year, aren't you? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Mervyn's a, roughly a year, I'm there from 2004, um, hence the lanes, but... Uh, W w the negative experience that I'd had with the Arts Council, um, to be awfully honest, and he knows me by now that I call a spiel to shovel, mm -hmm. I make no bones about it, uh, was when we came up with what we would have thought were quite solid artistic um, projects, uh, and they were passed after an amount of hurdle jumping, 
Uh, we then were told that it had to be either a facilitator registered with or acknowledged by the, the Arts Council. Now, that's fine, and I understand there has to be a degree of framework built around that way, you know, things go forward. But it stifles probably a lot of young people trying to break into that circle. Mm. And that was one of the most frustrating um, elements of working with the Arts Council within a, a working class unionist area that I found in all the time that I'd been at the Spectrum. Mm. And there were some fantastic projects that just went to the wall over. Okay. They well, probably slapped well, my home and I go out of here. Absolutely. <laughs> Is it possible to, to, you know, now that Mervyn's in place, maybe to reactivate some of those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, they, they will be. We, we were just discussing a, a primary school thing for Belfast there, mm -hmm. which will enhance um, primary school children of either year six, seven, and eight become writers. Uh, 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 through stories and storytelling, yeah. and we're not letting the cat out of that bag because we know you've all got communities. So we'll hold on to that one. I'll be right. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks, Chair. You, Miss McCabot. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chair. And thanks very much for your presentation. Pleasure. Um, and, and a lot of what I was going to say, Dominic has covered, but you did touch on, on something, um, and that was the the skills base and. Um, and what can be achieved, mm -hmm. uh, but the social skill base and what you offer uh, through your centre uh, could open doors, in my opinion, uh, for the youth and, and maybe the women that, that use your centre. But you also championed on your achievements and you made a list, and one of those achievements was your volunteers. Mm -hmm. But I ask you, how does the centre go about uh, recruiting volunteers or getting the volunteers in uh, in order to, to deliver programmes? Yeah. And once you get them in through the door, is there any um, certificate of achievements offered, um, or uh, you know that that the like of maybe a, a young person building up um, and begin to uh, sorry begin to build up their um, CV? Mm -hmm. uh, what opportunities are given uh, uh, there? You know, because we do all have communities and we're all looking at ideas on how to. Yeah. Uh, introduce them all into our communities. Yeah. In terms of, of volunteering, we just get a, a minibus, minibus out and, and just go and press gang people and you know, club them and take them in and make them volunteer. <laughs> no, we don't. Um, it's, it's a range of, of tactics and approaches. We have people who have come into existing groups um, and we see that they have sort of ability and, and skill and confidence and we encourage them then to go a little bit further. Uh, we have a book club uh, that's run solely by a volunteer. Um, we give them the, 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 the room, um, she produces the flyers, she, she gets them out, chews the books, they link with the Crescent, does all of that. Um, and she was a member of the, of the, the women's arts group for a couple of years uh, and then said, what else can I do? I've enjoyed that, what else can I, what else can I do? Um, we had somebody in recently who wants to run some dance classes, um, born and brought up in the area, moved away, now wants to come back, wants to give something back. Um, the, through the, the course of the play, we had parents coming in with, with their children um, and then staying and then saying, can we sell programs tonight? Can we do something else? What can we do? So we tend to try and we don't have a formal volunteering program. We tend to sort of let, let um, opportunities emerge and come out. Um, in terms of the, the qualifications, it's interesting this year, we, we um, again, in our, our Arts Council bid, we've put in uh, to try and to trial uh, an open college network qualification. Um, so we want to establish a, a more formalized community volunteer program. Um, and as a result of that, then look at if somebody's working over a sustained period of time, you know, a couple of hours a week over a 12, 12 month period, um, how can they produce a portfolio which we then can accredit and they can have some certification at, at the end. Um, so we have a pilot project in to, to, to try and, and look at delivering that. Um, because you're right, the danger is that a volunteer comes in and it's all well and good, it's good for them, it's good for us, but nobody's capturing it and some of the, those, those wider benefits, particularly for young people uh, and young people who might not aspire more academically, uh, then there's a missed opportunity. So we're, we're certainly looking at trying to, to, to plug that gap as well. Yeah, and just, just one other, um, the, on the formal uh, partnership agreements that you mentioned uh, uh -huh. just at the end of your presentation, how the Spectrum Centre uh, see that be achieved? Um, I think it maybe goes back to, to, to Dominic's point in terms of, you know, is, there has to be probably a willingness with those bigger organisations to, 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 to enter into that. 
um, either as a, a, with a range of organisations or, or you know, pick a, a particular organisation and, and, and choose to, to, to partner. Um, the formalities of a partnership agreement are pretty straightforward in terms of thereafter, you know, what, what, what are you putting in, what are we putting in, what are we trying to achieve. Uh, it's probably where, where is the impetus for that coming um, and maybe a, a call or a challenge to the bigger organisations to, to, you know, to help us on the ground. Who's going to take the lead? That's what well, I would, I would more than happily take the lead as long as there's a willingness and, a, and an open door and we're not going to invest an awful lot of time and energy that's, that's not going to Get produce a reward yeah. because there's, there's plenty of other things in the, on the to-do list to be done. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Mr McMullen. Yes, and thank you very much for your presentation. It's very interesting. One thing that uh, caught me interest was your talk on cultural tourism. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I'm going to be there. Well, uh, I, I usually handle the culture of tourism as I have uh, worked along with uh, Belfast City Council and we have produced a guidebook to the Shanghai, whereas you don't really need a tour guide as such. You'll open the book up and it'll give you a little tour, takes you around, uh, explains various parts and I think the sections in it are called the inside story. So you would get the inside story of the Lower Shanghai estate and the murals therein. Woodville Park, the Shankill Graveyard, the Peace Wall, places like that, the Crumlin Road Jail. Uh, it, it can get quite busy in the summer. I'm doing tours with Syracuse University from New York, Syracuse University <coughs> London campus, and a wide range of uh, Southern Irish groups who come in through either Coista or Abic and who are not necessarily interested in a political tour, but like to hear the social history and cultural tour of the area. And that's where I step in and I fill that void. Uh, on behalf of Spectrum, and I guide them around the Shankill in somewhat of a, a two-hour two hour walking tour. Are you get any help from tourist board with that? To, to be honest, we haven't asked the tourist board yet in terms of a formalised product. We haven't got a formalised product probably to, to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting. We have a, a, again a sort of a, a network of people coming together in a couple of weeks' time to see how we can put a more cohesive product together, and that's probably where we'd, we'd be back to the to the tourist okay. board. Um, I'm struck by the number of people who come onto the Schenkel Road and send a bobby outside. I came into the office yesterday, there was a, a, a couple from Switzerland stood outside in the rain uh, trying to, to get their bearings. We got them sorted out. A couple of French people came in afterwards. Um, so people who either get off the, the tour bus or, or, or walk up. Um, and they're fascinated by the fact that we say, go and see where John Hewitt was born or yeah. Come and have a look at some of the prints that we've got from William Connor, because he was born and brought up in the, in, in, in the <coughs> Shankill area. <coughs> and there's a sudden realisation that actually we came to see certain elements of your most recent history, um, and you're now offering as a wider menu. So that's what we're trying to, to harness the, the, the project with um, Cultureland, in terms of creative and cultural Belfast, is around the River Farset. Um, now, it's pretty much concreted over. Um, but obviously is the river that gives its name to, to Belfast. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're trying to, within that project, also include that, that tourist element um, and see if we can bring people out of the city centre because obviously the social economic, particularly probably economic benefits, yeah. will, will, be, will be something that we should be harnessing within, within the community. I, I listened to what you said something earlier on there about the uh, majority of your people coming to you are from the, the greater Shankill area. One of the groups there from East, East Belfast uh, did look at the uh, postcode of where people were coming from to their performances and the majority were working class. But they were saying that the middle class people in that were tending more to go into the city centre than mm -hmm. coming to something on their doorstep. Mm -hmm. Do you find the same thing? Mm -hmm. I, I would agree. Well, well, my experience goes back further than Mervyn's. Mm -hmm. and, um, one of the questions we're, we're, we're always asked is, is the car safe? Well, I've been there from 2004 and we have yet to record one incident of anybody's car being damaged at any time <coughs> in any way connected to Spectrum Centre or its activities. So once their minds put it at rest, whereas it was a minimum, it has rose, not an awful lot, but it has rose, and it's still a problem where do you attract people from outside your own area? You know, but I think other communities will suffer in as much as that West Belfast, North Belfast geographical position, people sort of that and, and yeah. the news that's attached to it, people tend to look at it. But Spectrum's been breaking the barriers down. 
Yeah. No, no doubt whatsoever about that. I mean, one of the greatest things we were able to do within the last four years, and again, Mervyn missed it, was we turned our main hall into a TV studio and we invited TG4 up. And TG4 done the Irish language programme of Gladiators. Mm -hmm. Not or breaking drama like, but but we had guys down and I'd said this act of having a smoke and talking in Gaelic and nobody paying a blind bit of difference to them. So you know, and we had a, a small audience from Southern Ireland up to watch that. So in terms of that, we're breaking that we're breaking those barriers down. Yeah. Oliver, there's probably something in terms of, of uh, the product and in terms of, of in, in essence, <coughs> certainly for plays, what we're offering. Um, we did postcode analysis on, on Tartan, Diablo, and Crimea Square, um, and we found th that that split, you know, that, that they weren't exclusively, that there was probably that the majority of the audience was, was, was from the immediate community, but not exclusively. So, so people were prepared to travel from other parts <coughs> of the province or other parts of the city to watch something. And obviously each one of those, Tartan was about the gangs, uh, in the 1970s, so a fusion of, of what it was like being a young person then, and the music and the culture and the, and the, and the backdrop of, 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 the, of the, the political situation. Diablo was obviously something around human trafficking and sex, sexual exploitation, um, which again, for, for a lot of groups, is, is something that, that strikes a chord, and they wanted to, to, to see a hard-hitting play and hear an officer from the PSNI talk about what they were doing in terms of you know, activity on the ground. So we're finding that it, depending on what you put in, all of those were played to full houses, which was fantastic. Um, but the product will, will, will bring people in. And do you have a program for the disabled? Um, we don't have an, a, a specific program I for. Answer. I am starting to be, in, I'm working now with uh, Action on Hearing Loss, and we're looking at bringing uh, Action on Hearing Loss to the centre at a later point this year. But it's in its early stages at the minute, but it's a giant leap forward in terms of of what we do and who we get with it. We have arthritis cure in on uh, weekly meetings. They hold their weekly meetings there. And we have other people who are less abled uh, who come to other events. In fact, uh, Olympus Dance Group has uh, a disabled section as part of their dance program. So they're there, they have their own room, and they, they partake right up even in, into the display, <coughs> which is held the last two nights uh, in May. So there's more to be done, certainly more to be done, but we're starting to reach out now to the likes of hearing loss and probably those people who are, have, have sight problems, stuff like that, you know. Or uh, the residency programme with Open Arts was a real eye-opener for, for me. Um, their orchestra uh, was made up of people with physical disability and, and learning difficulty and disability, um, and it was fascinating to watch, watch them operate as, as, a, you know, as, as, uh, as instructors. Uh, and, and working very collaboratively with with with, uh, with, with, with those groups. Um, I don't think I alluded as much to the older people work that we're doing, but we have a really uh, fantastic um, collaboration with Hemsworth Court, which is sort of a sheltered accommodation for older people with dementia. Yeah. Um, and, and we're now bringing, we're taking activity to Hemsworth Court. Hemsworth Court are coming into the centre, yeah. and that's proving to be to be a really really positive piece of work as well. Thank you very much, Sadie. I'm, I'm I didn't realise you had as much going on there, and uh, quite mm. honestly, I, I didn't even know anything about you at all to the day. Yeah. So there's, there's well, a one of the actual new, one of the new ideas is actually the creation of reminiscence boxes, which will act as triggers for mm. people with dementia, yeah, and Alzheimer's. So well, I, I was thinking more special needs people, you know, the young ch children yeah. there, you know, Down syndrome, <laughs> people with autism, people like that there who. Um, Challenging behaviour. Absolutely, and that's, yeah. that's a piece of work that yeah. we need to look at. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Congratulations. Sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Humphrey, who is no stranger to the spectrum. Indeed. <laughs> that's right, Chair. Um, thank you both very much for your presentation. Um, I should declare an interest, um, two interests, I suppose. Um, as a former um, board member of the partnership and chair of Shangle Tourism. Um, I've been asked to ask a question from Mr. Mr. Hildich, who's obviously had to go to another meeting. It was the, um, the question he put to uh, New Lodge Arts was, how would you rate the assistance stroke interaction stroke support from the established high-end well-known arts organisations to your organisation at Spectrum? Um, I think we've already sort of <coughs> alluded to that in terms of um, that there is a, a contact, there is... Uh, and has been sort of joint work. Um, 
my impression in, in the last 12 months is that I've been doing more of the, the proactivities from, being from my side, uh, certainly in terms of the submission we put into the Arts Council, in terms of the collaborative programme with, with the MAC. Uh, we went to their outreach officer uh, and, and, and sort of made the, the initial sort of uh, comments there and, and, and suggestions, which fair play to him, he, he picked up on and we've been able to, to, uh, to run with. Um, but certainly the, the, the impetus came from, from ourselves. It's interesting when we talk about sort of, uh, it's just made me think about established, there's established organisations, of which there are probably a few, but in terms of established individuals, um, we've got a, a, a tremendous track record uh, and there seems to be a real willingness at an individual level for, for people to, to come back and, and, and to work with us. So the, say the creative writing masterclasses that we've just uh, finished off with included Martin Lynch and, 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 and Joe Egan, both of whom had no qualms about coming. Uh, we did a, a, a series of, of interviews with, with playwrights. Uh, we had people like Christina Reid and Lucy Caldwell, Casey Gregg, Mary Jones, you know, all very established authors in their own right who, again, had, had no issue coming and, 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 and working with us and working with a, a relatively small group. Um, but, but coming yeah, for, think, for an hour and an effort too. Yeah, I think he's more talking about, you know, Arts Council, Mac, Lyric, <coughs> you know, th those who will put money yeah. into the, rather than um, people who are uh, actors or writers or playwrights or whatever. Well, certainly in terms of the established organisations, <coughs> the impetus is probably more with, with, with ourselves, but there's, there's, at least there's an open door there that we're, that we're working on. But I certainly, in my time, have not been approached by people like the Lyric or, or the Grand Opera in terms of, mm. of collaborative projects. Um, our relationship with the Arts Council is, is probably different in terms of um, it's obviously it's a core funder. Um, I think in, in the past we were we had um, core annual funding, which which isn't the case now. So we, we go on a, a on a on a an annual basis and seek funding from from the Arts Council. Um, and Touchwood will we'll get something for this coming year. Um, in saying that, within the last six months, we've secured funding through their Older People Programme, um, and we've secured funding through their Small Grants. And the Small Grants are a very interesting one because we're setting up a Saturday morning sort of arts clinic workshop for either aspiring artists or emerging artists or established artists within the, the community or residence artists uh, in, in the studio are going to be delivering those, those sessions and very much about upskilling people who have that interest. So again, that, that grounds well, that community stuff. To William, the, the, the relationship with the Arts Council is probably slightly different as, as, a, as a core funder, um, although we take a lot of expertise and experience from our, our, our link community development worker. Okay. Um, the committee a couple of weeks ago was in Coleraine, and we heard uh, from, from the guy in charge there that uh, it's years since they got direct funding from the Arts Council. Uh, and uh, last week we heard from a slightly contradictory position from East Belfast Partnership, but we did hear that that um, there is a problem with people in East Belfast crossing the bridge to go into the city centre to the main sort of mm -hmm. theatres uh, and arts centres and so on. And we've just heard from New Lodge uh, Arts this, this morning that the, the same applies to, to them working in North Belfast as you work in North and West Belfast. Um, can I ask you, um, you know, what are the barriers? You've alluded to some of them in your presentation. What are the barriers to our young people accessing the arts? Because we had examples and testimonies from two, two young people from New Lodge basically saying, had it not been for what they had, the work they've been doing through New Lodge Arts, they wouldn't be involved in the extent that they are and the, the confidence that that has given them. Mm -hmm. I think we'd probably, well, have, we didn't hear, obviously, yeah, yeah. what, what the submission, submission was, but I suspect we would probably concur with, with, with what they were saying. Um, I was minded when I spoke to the, to the young people who are part of the, the young people's group. Um, now, they talk very confidently about going to the MAC and being involved in Culture Night and being to the Grand Opera House, and, you know, it, it, it runs off the tongue very, very easily and very readily. Um, so there's, there's a great confidence, and they've been there and they've, they've been exposed to it. But when I asked them in terms of, and, and how did that happen, it was because uh, artists, staff, the program had taken the young people to that as part of the, the overall program. They hadn't gone there of, of, their, own, of their own volition. Um, part of it was, it's a long way to go. Mum and dad won't let us go into the city centre. 
we don't know what's on offer. It's a big building. It looks a bit scary. We're not sure whether we want to go inside. Um, you know, there's a, there's a raft of, of, of reasons, uh, not a sole reason. They, they, they were coming up with a range of, of reasons. Once they had the confidence and they were encouraged to go in, then it was it was less of a uh, it was less of an issue, and they were and they were then prepared to do that under their under their own steam. Um, so that there's what was on offer, the, the the knowledge of what was on offer, the the, the imposing nature of the building, the, the uh, I guess the perception they had about the the, the, the Mac, the, the not being able to pick information up readily in, in the community, all factors uh, that was that was prohibiting them from, from doing it readily. Mm. Um, Chair, this inquiry uh, was, was established uh, in the autumn and there's been some criticism by journalists and key protagonists in the, uh, the arts world about this inquiry. And, and, um, can I ask you in terms of the decal family, mm -hmm. what have your experiences been? Well, we alluded to the old circus so suddenly we couldn't get them come to the spectrum and they, were, they, they made the contact. What have your experiences been since we started talking about this? Um, since we've started, since the inquiry started, there hasn't been there hasn't been a great difference uh, in, in terms of uh, or a noticeable difference from from uh, from other organisations coming coming to us. To be quite honest, from the decal family. Yeah, yeah. With well, the exception of obviously the, the, the orchestra <coughs> has, has been in. We did have a flurry of activity as part of Creativity Month. Um, and there was an encouragement and an enablement of, of, of that happening. Mm -hmm. um, so Arma Planetarium, uh, Cinemagic were, were, were in as well. So, so those, those things have happened. Um, we've managed to secure some funding to, to uh, work with integrated services to put some IT equipment into, into one of the, the, the areas. Um, but certainly there hasn't been a relationship with the Arts Council has, has maintained that it's the same relationship we probably had prior to the uh, to, to, to the um, no discernible no improvement. Well, we can ask you, um, in terms of people in the Shankill, you and I come from there, my argument has always been that the people in our community see their culture as culture. Correct. Uh, and they don't basically see their culture as the arts necessarily. Would you mm -hmm. agree with that? Yes, I would agree with it. Um, the, the, the thing that you have to try and get people in is their arts and culture or as culture in the arts. Uh, I mean, we would go on to do so, uh, very, very simple programs with children. As um, There are elements within everybody's community with direct culture, either one way or another. Uh, and to produce the pure culture, you ask children, what does culture mean to you? Give us a picture, give us a story. Uh, well, what do you mean, Bobby? So you sit down and you talk them through the more or less the, uh, the basics of, of what a culture is. It could be dance, it could be music, it could be film, it could be photographs, and then you get some very, very surprising results. Uh, once you take them out of that bubble of where other people are driving them, this is your culture, that's your culture. Maybe mother, maybe dad, it could be big lad at the corner, it doesn't really matter. It's breaking that, it's breaking, it's bursting that bubble and getting kids to understand that their, their culture is art, and art is actually in their culture. Be that in the shape or form of a photograph, a banner, doesn't really matter. It is art. And I have yet to meet the person who can actually define the word art. Okay, Chair, thank you. Thank you, Ian. You've, you've said that um, young people speak very confidently about going to arts venues and so on. Do you think that the barriers um, are different throughout the generations? Um, I think there are, yeah, yeah. The, the problem, the, there's different barriers and they're probably experienced differently. Um, I'm just thinking of, of the, the women's arts groups who would have shared a similar in terms of oh, it's not for us and, and we'll, we'll look out of place and, and we, you know, should we go, shan't we go? Um, so, so that sort of almost fear, as it were, or, or you know, the, the, the misconception or preconception is, is, is probably the same. Um, you mean about, so, uh, in terms of the, of my, the community I, that I come from, and we were a very industrial community, uh, and we were seen as that, so therefore it really wasn't for us. Um, it was a BT9 thing, you pardon my expression. Um, it was Ibra. Um, yeah, quite a few younger people coming up through the 60s broke those shackles off from the <coughs> industrial communities. Um, 
I, I would dare say the nationalist community embraced the arts a lot more than the, the unionist communities because of, of their, their, their definitive tie to industrialization. And it was as simple as that. Uh, they were working, they, they seen their lives as being spending a day in the factory and a night at home or whatever in the local pub. But as far as going to watch an opera or a play, that wouldn't even have crossed their minds for a minute. Uh, and in many ways, peer pressure didn't allow people to break out of that. Um, it, it is changing now. Quite a few people go to the opera house and think nothing more of it than anything else. But growing up, and I grew up in Belfast in the 60s and the Shankill in the 70s, and when I went to the opera house, not this side of Christmas. And those were different times, and I think absolutely. The and now we are. That stage was very different as well. We're improving. We're, we have come leaps and bounds, where people quite openly talk about going to see a play or a show, and it is. It's a huge shift in the ground. Like you know, it's it's earth. It's of earthquake sort of sizes we're talking about here, because it it, it just de-emphasised the point in unionist industrial communities. It wasn't the done thing. Mr. McJimsey. Yeah, cheers. Uh, thanks, Chair, uh, and thanks for the presentation. I congratulate the pair of you on uh, the progress that you're making. I'm particularly interested in the sort of impact we're having on young people, because in areas like the Shankill, just as areas like Sandy Road and so on, uh, the young people who are our future and they're so easily led astray, and it's so important that uh, we get some sort of impact. I <coughs> think you're making an impact. What are the lessons? Right. that you think for making an impact with young people. How well do you think the education system responds to you, particularly at primary school level, secondary school level? How are they working with you to give you a chance uh, to basically show our young people uh, what their potential is uh, and uh, what their future could be, uh, as opposed, as you say, uh, what is being mapped out for them, perhaps by previous generations who are the big fella in the corner? Well, speaking personally, because I go around the primary schools and in the pack, Mervyn has that yellow holder there. In the pack, we have produced two activity books. One is called The Shankle at War, which looks at the Belfast Blitz in terms of the Shankle and what you know what you would have seen or heard of. It was passed by three different principals to make sure it was classroom friendly and you make sure it tied into what something the kids can tie into today. For instance, there is a page full of groceries and uh, the, the, the child is asked to go to Tesco's or Sainsbury's with mum, how many of those groceries exist? So they are able to pick out what they can identify from there to the end. Um, we have just recently finished the Great War activity book, which has uh, elements in it for colouring in. Um, we sit down and we tell, and we, I don't mean no disrespect whatsoever in any shape or form, but there are groups within communities here that have people believing that the First World War existed entirely off the Battle of the Somme. Mm. There was nothing before it. There was nothing after it. Uh, this Great War Activity book, which is in that folder, goes on a way of showing, the, showing children, particularly primary school children, of the bigger picture. And, and it's through that, as I'm going through the schools, that we introduce them to people like Graves, Service, Sassoon, which are all the great war poets. Uh, and, and therefore, you're introducing them to the arts at an early level. You're teaching them poetry. You get them to do story writing. Um, the primary schools so far that I've visited, Black Mountain, uh, Fourth River, Spring Hill, have been fantastic. Through the classroom open, go ahead, do it. We do bring artifacts with us. We bring some old helmets. We do bring a deactivated 303 rifle so the children can feel the weight of it. Uh, and a lot of the uh, things that we have found in terms of um, children learning things about their own community is sometimes mommy or someone in the family sets little Tommy or little Jill on her knee and yesterday's furry stories evidently become tomorrow's prejudice. So it's straightening, them, straightening the story out from the word go with the likes of the activity books and factual things and sitting down and talking to the classrooms at their level and not over their heads, that we, we start to we move forward. And maybe in some of the recent stories that we had, that everybody has a part to play. For instance, in the spectrum window, we have the window done up for the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And the mannequin that's in the window, and it was not by accident, is a coloured mannequin, and it represents Palais. 
Okay, so kids don't see the coloured mannequin, they see Pele. And that is another small step forward for our community to accept people from outside that we have all a part to play in this game of life. Uh, so, yeah, we work with the schools. We, we, we give them the bigger picture instead of that sort of slide shot that they get within their own communities of how things are or what. I deal with cultural questions as, as opposed to uh, the unionist history and stuff like that. And you would be amazed at some of the answers on the questionnaire we did some six, seven years ago that who did the Ulster Division fight at the Somme? Was it A, the Germans, B, the Irish, or someone else? As far as the kids were concerned, it was the Irish. So that had to be straightened out. We did that. I would be a lot more confident handing that question out to younger people today than I would then. So we're moving forward, Chris. We're, we're moving forward. There's some probably bits there about uh, certainly about the impact in terms of some of you asked about lessons uh, and lessons learned. Those are some of the key lessons are things about developing relationships, building relationships, uh, certainly with the primary schools, and are absolutely crucial in terms of um, we say we're going to go and do something, we go in and we deliver it, uh, and we ask for their, their, their evaluation and their comments. So in essence, we follow through with what we've, we've done. Um, and it, it resonates and, and sort of complements the, the curriculum as well. So we're not just going in and offering what we want to do. It, 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 it supplements what, what's being delivered within, within school. And all of those are, are crucial. You get much more opportunity to engage with schools um, if they know what we're delivering and how it fits and what the, you know, what the children and people are going to get out of it at, at the other end. That's all been, that's all been crucial. Okay, that's good. Very much. Can I thank you both yeah. for your presentation and for taking questions this morning? Um, it's been very interesting, and I'm sure if there's anything that we need to follow up with, that you'll be able to forward us by all means. necessary information. Well, we alluded to the, the, the purple, or the purple, yellow folder. So, if, if it's okay with the committee, I'll leave that. There's a whole range of some of the materials that we've and books that we've produced, just to give you an additional flavour of stuff that's there. It saves me from carrying it back as well. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for your Thanks time. A million. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you members. Um, just moving then through the rest of the agenda, there have been no new invitations, so the invitation track is as it was last week. Um, just in the event of receiving freedom of information um, request just during summer recess, um, committees have been asked just to delegate authority to the chair and deputy chair to respond on the committee's behalf. So if you're content that we do that, this is just normal practice for this time of year. Agreed. Okay. Moving then to the forward work program at page 166, and there are uh, a number of changes, which Peter will just briefly um, Sure, I canter through this. Um, we're, we're looking at planning a strategic um, session for the committee to plan for the upcoming 14-15 um, session. We're looking at having that in Fermanagh and incorporating, meeting some stakeholders particularly involved with angling and angling tourism. That will then flow into a committee meeting, hopefully at uh, Waterways uh, Ireland's uh, headquarters in Enniskillen. So it'll basically be a, a southwest sort of Fermanagh-based couple of days. We'll give members more details on that as we get things sorted out. Um, we're also looking at doing another stakeholder event for the inquiry. Uh, this time we, we've had requests to do one in Belfast and we're looking at potentially having it um, at the Lyric and then running a committee meeting simultaneously as well also at the, the Lyric. So we're, we're working on that one as well. Members are also aware uh, already of the trip to the Resource Centre, the Archive at Swords, scheduled for the 2nd of October, that's going to be with the Environment Committee. We're looking at other elements of that programme as well, and we're going to let members have details of that in due course. Okay, members content? Um, any other business? There's nothing has been, been notified. If happy enough, we'll move into closed session. Assembly Committee Room 21. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 21.